Welcome to the Justice Committee's 11th meeting of 2019. We have apologies from Shona Robson, and welcome back to the committee, Bill Kidd, who will be attending as her substitute. I also note that there's a group of officials from the Jordanian Parliament in the gallery. Welcome to the Parliament and to the Parliament's Justice Committee. Agenda item one is consideration of the Management of Offenders Scotland Bill at stage two. I'd ask members to refer to their copy of the bill and to the marshalled list of amendments and groupings for this item. I welcome Hamza Yusuf, Cabinet Secretary for Justice, and his officials to the meeting. I note that towards the end of um, our consideration today, we'll need to swap officials um, supporting the Cabinet Secretary, so I'll uh, suspend briefly at that point. And we now begin our consideration of amendments. Call Amendment 2 in the name of Daniel John Johnson, grouped with amendments as shown in the groupings. Amendments 54 and 55 are preempted by Amendment 93 in the group Minor and Technical. Amendment 58 is preempted by Amendment 95 in the group Details in relation to monitoring. Amendment 59 is preempted by Amendment 99 in the group Details in relation to monitoring. Daniel Johnson to move Amendment 2 and speak to all amendments in the group. Thank you very much, convener. I'd just like to begin uh, uh, by reassuring colleagues that while there may be almost 70 amendments in this grouping, I, I probably only need about five minutes to cover off each one. Um, <laughs> in, in all seriousness, uh, th while there are a lot of amendments in this group, there is actually one simple idea, and that is that we should avoid using the word offender in legislation and indeed in uh, public statements. And that's because language matters. And indeed, the Scottish Government on the 1st of May 2015 gave a commitment to stop using uh, the word offender, or uh, either in terms, uh, in, ter uh, sorry, uh, in terms of ex-offender or ex-prisoner. And they were right to do so, because when it comes to people uh, changing their lives, and rehabilitating and returning to society, it's important that we give them every opportunity to do so. By continuing to use uh, terminology such as offender or prisoner when those convictions are, uh, are, are, are discharged, and indeed once they are spent, I think we continue to stigmatise uh, that, that individual and make it more difficult for them to make those changes in their life. So uh, the, the, uh, the uh, purpose of uh, these amendments is to replace the word offender uh, wherever possible in the bill with the term relevant person, which is much more neutral uh, uh, and avoids uh, that issue. I don't believe that it has any technical implications, although I uh, obviously appreciate insight from the government on that point. But I think this is an opportunity to use new language and alter that. And while I understand that much of this uh, bill does relate to previous legislation, I do believe that through drafting, we can use this to draw a line under the use of this terminology to refer to people when they are no longer uh, prisoners uh, and therefore help with the rehabilitation and destigmatize uh, uh, those individuals and the issues that they face. Uh, I move the amend. Uh, sorry, I don't move at this point, do I? Yes. I move the amendments in my name. Okay. Lee MacArthur. Much can I um, thank Daniel Johnson for bringing forward um, all of these amendments and not spending five minutes speaking to, to each of them. Uh, I think the points he makes are very relevant. We heard that in evidence, certainly the early evidence uh, we got to the committee uh, about uh, the impact that constant referral to uh, offenders um, would have in our efforts to um, try and uh, Im improve the rehabilitation of, of those who have served, served a custodial sentence. I suppose the only thing, um, as well as confirming my support for the amendments, is perhaps to, to ask a, a question to the Cabinet Secretary that um, in, in moving to reference to relevant person, I know that um, when we were taking evidence there was a concern that um, by talking about offenders, um, the use of electronic monitoring for those on bail um, uh, pre-conviction uh, was not possible. I don't know whether uh, or not that may now be possible as a result of, um, if the committee supports these amendments, as a result of the, the changes. It's quite a substantive amendment to be introducing at stage three, I appreciate, but um, certainly would welcome the, the, the Cabinet Secretary's comments now or perhaps after he's had time to reflect on that. 
Thanks very John much. Finney. Okay, thank you. Mayor. I'll be very brief. It's just to say I will be lending support to Daniel. And it, it was the phrase, language is very important, and people have stigmatised enough by their involvement with the criminal justice system without there being a, a lasting legacy. So I think these are very positive amendments. Uh, Liam Kerr. Thank you, Convener. <clears throat> I can't support these amendments uh, at all. I, I, do, I do understand the point that's being made here. Um, I just don't agree with it. Um, the term offender is used because that's what a person is, someone who has offended. And I, I do accept language does matter, but that's why we have to use language that's relevant, the, the language that says what has happened. And uh, leaving aside that we can't airbrush the fact that an offence has been committed. You know, a crime has been committed here. But I also point to uh, the seminal work, the, the rule of law um, by Lord Bingham, uh, who set out the first principle of law is that it must be accessible, clear and predictable. So it must say what it refers to, uh, and, and as far as possible not deal in semantic gymnastics, as I think you're... Uh, Daniel Johnson is trying to do. So for that reason, I shall oppose the amendments. Yeah. Um, just to answer John Finney's question, it does say in this per part um, that relevant person means an individual who's been convicted of any offence. And I, I totally agree that um, language does matter, but there's also a need for the law, in my opinion, to be as clear and unambiguous as, as possible. And um, while I have a lot of sympathy and sometimes the way that ex-offenders are referred to when there is no need for that to be the case, I think in this case, in this legislation, to make sure that it is absolutely um, as clear as possible, then to support this amendment would merely muddy the water. Cabinet Secretary. Oh, sorry, Fulton. <coughs> I, I'll be very brief, uh, convener. Thanks for that. Uh, it's just to say that I've got um, a lot of sympathy with uh, Daniel uh, Johnson's amendments here, um, but I probably would like to hear uh, the Cabinet Secretary's summing up in terms of there's going to be any uh, unintended consequences of the amendments uh, before uh, deciding on, on my vote for the Cabinet Secretary. Uh, thank you. Thank you, <coughs> excuse me, to Daniel Johnson for bringing forward uh, these amendments uh, and also for the rest of the committee for uh, their thoughts. I'll try to pick up on a variety of points that were made. Daniel Johnson, uh, Liam MacArthur, John Finney and, and, and Fulton McGregor <coughs> all in some way or another ask about perhaps some of the unintended consequences uh, that may well uh, come about uh, and, uh, as a result of these amendments and I hope to be able to touch on that. But before I do, can I just associate myself with the remarks made by Daniel Johnson um, and actually just to give a differing opinion to, to, to that of Liam Kerr that I think it's more than just um, as, as the phrase you use, semantic uh, gymnastics. I think when I talk to those who, who work um, with people who have been to prison, who have served community sentences for the offences they've committed, so have paid their debt to society, um, but have transformed their lives, uh, they often tell you and will have told have told me, and I'm sure would tell you if you have visited uh, the likes of the Wise Group and others, that the stigma that they face, even though they have paid their debt back to society, is an incredibly uh, difficult one when it comes to employment and any future uh, opportunities in life. And of course, uh, I'd let Liam Kerr back in. Uh, I'm, I'm very grateful, Cabinet Secretary, because I, I don't disagree with your point, actually. Um, but does that not go towards the point the convener made about uh, this, this bill is very much dealing with people who are in the offending cycle, if you like, uh, and the convener's point was about uh, making a distinction between how language is used after the uh, sentence has been served. Uh, and is that not the distinction that uh, you're making there as well? I will, I will touch upon that point. I think he's, he's not wrong to, to make the point around uh, the purpose of this bill that is looking at uh, electronic monitoring, so therefore uh, the, the, the result of an offence having, having been committed. So let me try to touch upon uh, some of those issues uh, where, where I can. But I have to say the, the evidence given at stage one, I thought, from um, a number of organisations, from the Howard League to, 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 to many others, uh, community justice, 
justice partners, I thought was was very convincing. Um, so, in that context, we'll be supporting the vast majority uh, of, of 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 the uh, amendments. Um, however, um, I should say parts of the language uh, are necessarily tied uh, to language used in earlier reserved legislation, which is an important point uh, to make. For example, in the 1974 Act. Um, so, I want to touch upon perhaps perhaps some of those technical issues uh, in my speech. Uh, in my remarks. Uh, well, I, I do not concede that the term offender is wrong in the context of part one of the bill. Uh, I'm not opposing, as I say, most of these. Uh, the term relevant person has the advantage uh, of removing the grounds for misunderstanding over the potential uh, narrowness of the, the breadth of offender. But I recognise uh, this was the stage uh, focus of some of the discussion um, from several quarters, as I say, at stage one. However, in course of um, stage three of the bill, I'll, I'll consider the use of the term relevant person uh, in part one of the bill to ensure that the substitution of that term uh, in place of the term offender does not make for awkward reading uh, in conjunction with the various references in part one to designated person. Um, I have to take a, a very different position on, on Amendment 63, where a definition of the term relevant person is proposed. Um, by defining the term uh, relevant person so as to include only those individuals who have been convicted of an offence, uh, this amendment would significantly limit the scope of part one. Uh, for my part, I'm very clear that part one is not limited to post-conviction disposals. Therefore, uh, part one could cover pre-conviction disposals, uh, such as bail conditions, at a later date. That's for the same reason that I'm also opposing uh, amendment 68 to 70. Uh, these amendments would alter the long title of the bill to refer only to persons who have been convicted of an offence. I think it's worth reminding members uh, of some of the background uh, here. Section 1 of the bill explicitly does not refer to uh, quote-unquote convicted persons, but rather more simply to persons uh, who are then more generally described as offenders, as a shorthand label for use for purposes uh, of this part of the bill. Uh, additionally, Section 1 does not refer to disposals as being final or post-conviction. Cases are uh, disposed of at various stages uh, of proceedings, uh, and bail is a particular disposal uh, at a specific stage. So, while at present the list of disposals at Section 3.2 does not currently include any pre-conviction disposal, Section 4.2 explicitly states that entries may relate to anything Again, I quote, at any stage of criminal proceedings. It's important to note that this statement is obviously and deliberately unqualified by reference to conviction having occurred. Uh, so I indicated at stage one my intention to bring forward an amendment to further clarify this very position in part one of the bill. Uh, unfortunately, uh, my amendment itself was, was ruled inadmissible on grounds of scope by the convener uh, when I tried to lodge it. Uh, it's, of course, uh, the convener's decision uh, to make. However, I would repeat again that part one of the bill was devised with the intention of enabling pre-conviction disposals to be added to the list in section three at a later date uh, via subordinate legislation. Um, there was clear support expressed at stage one uh, by a number of witnesses and members of the committee for the addition of bail to the list of disposals which can be electronically monitored. Uh, I'm clear that pre-conviction disposals such as bail can be included, as I say, subordinate legislation. So I think I have made that point uh, and, and I hope it's one that other committee members um, can agree this. Um, uh, I should emphasise uh, that uh, no disrespect to the convener uh, or the ruling at this stage of inadmissibility to, to my amendment. At stage three, the matter, of course, will be in the hands of the presiding officer. So in the meantime, of course. Um, I thank the Cabinet Secretary for, for taking the intervention. My understanding is that even in terms of technical grounds, the, the word offender can and has in the past referred to both people pre and post uh, sentencing, and that's what gives rise to the opportunity to look at whether or not um, amendments could be made for those who have not yet been sentenced. Is that the Cabinet Secretary's understanding as well? And, and I'd be interested in any technical insight that, uh, that, that he may have at his disposal. Uh, yeah, I suppose it goes back to, to what I said a minute ago. Um, you know, section one of the bill doesn't refer, uh, doesn't refer to convicted persons; just refers to persons, which then are generally described in almost a shorthand as "quote unquote" offenders. What your amendment sixty three does is give a definition which relies on post conviction, whereas we don't want to limit the scope. And I think Daniel Johnson, in fairness, will, will not want to limit the scope. I think the stage one report in relation to that um, showed broad support for looking at pre conviction. Uh, uses of electronic monitoring uh, as well. So, again, I reiterate my support for Daniel Johnson's amendments, just simply the unintended consequences um, of, of, of that. So, I support most of Daniel Johnson's amendments to replace uh, offender with relevant persons. The exceptions are 
A, the de restrictive definition of relevant person in Amendment 63, the restrictive changes to the long title Amendment 68 to, 60, yeah, 68 to 70, uh, and if Amendment 63 and 68 to 70 are pressed, I invite members uh, to reject them, but I would, I would ask uh, Daniel Johnson to, to, to think about uh, with, withdrawing them. Um, uh, as was already mentioned by, by the convener in the opening, Amendments 54, 55, 58 and 59 uh, are no longer necessary in light of other amendments we are making to Part 1. Um, in summary, I'm, I'm supportive of the amendments in this group. The change of term terminology, but as I say, I urge, members, well, I urge the member to withdraw, hopefully 63, 68 to 70, uh, but if he does press them, then uh, for other members to reject them. Uh, thank you, Cabinet Secretary. Uh, you have made res reference to the admissibility of uh, some amendments, so I think it's worthwhile putting out that the Management of Offenders Bill is about post-conviction measures and relates to the management of persons after their guilt is established. The amendments referred to cover pre-conviction before a person has been convicted of an offence. And as such, um, they would contravene one of the, the grounds uh, for um, inadmissibility, that amendment is not admissibility if it's not relevant to the bill. And these ones that were ruled inadmissible are not within the scope of the bill. At stage two, as the Cabinet rightly says, it's um, for the committee uh, convener under the standing orders to rule on admissibility, and for re reasons it has been uh, the amendments which the Cabinet Secretary referred to have been ruled inadmissible. Daniel Johnson to wind up our press or withdraw. Um, first of all, can I begin uh, by thanking uh, all the members who have contributed to this, uh, and, and in particular for the constructive manner and for recognising uh, a kind of the, the intent. Uh, uh, with which I, I've brought these amendments, in particular those who, who actually also disagree uh, with the amendments themselves. Uh, in particular, can I thank the Cabinet Secretary for his uh, constructive remarks. And, and just on, a, on a, the specific points around uh, Amendments 63, 68, 69 and 70, I will not press those, and I in particular accept his arguments that I would not want to limit the scope. In terms of the arguments made by those opposing the amendments, um, there are two key arguments being made, one on uh, uh, precision and clarity and the other on principle. On precision and clarity, the issue is, uh, as the Cabinet Secretary rightly pointed out, that this bill deals with people at a number of different stages within the criminal justice process. And I think continuing to label people and give them one uh, identification throughout that uh, is not helpful and is actually, it lacks uh, precision. Uh, and on, on the point of principle, I have one very clear principle when it comes to the criminal justice system, is that the criminal justice system must uh, seek to re rehabilitate and give people every opportunity to do so. When they fail to take those opportunities, absolutely the, the, the justice system must respond swiftly and, uh, 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 and robustly, but they must be given that opportunity. And I think uh, using unhelpful labels, stigmatising labels such as offender, uh, throughout the stage, stages uh, of the process, and indeed once they cease to be prisoners, I think is unhelpful. So for those reasons, I will be pressing all my amendments, save uh, six, uh, 63, uh, 68, 69 and 70. The question is that Amendment 2 be agreed. Are we all agreed? No. We are not all agreed. There will be a division. Those in favour, please show. Those against, please show. Okay. Mm -hmm. And there are no abstentions. So in favour, yes. Against, no. In favour, six, seven. seven. In favour, seven. Against, two. two. The amendment is therefore agreed. Call amendment two, three, four, five and six, all in the name of Daniel Johnson, all previously debated, and seven. Um, Daniel Johnson's to move amendments three to seven on block. Does any member have um, a, a problem or a, a object to these being moved on block? Daniel? Uh, moved on block. Thank you. 
The question is that amendments three to seven are agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. No. We are not agreed. Um, so there will be a division. All those in favour, please show. Against? Seven, yes, two, two. Right. Seven in favour, two against. Uh, the amendments are agreed. Call amendment 78 in the name of Liam Kerr and a group on its own. Liam Kerr to move and speak to amendment 78. Thank you, Convener. Good morning. Uh, this amendment, which I move, uh, seeks to ensure that the court will make available a summary of evidence uh, during the case. Now, uh, members will recall that during the stage one evidence, uh, James Maybe of Social Work Scotland told us that, and this is a direct quote, on the information and evidence that criminal justice social work receives to inform our risk and needs assessment and the level of service case management inventory tool, what is sorely lacking is the summaries of evidence that are narrated in court. Uh, he goes on to say, it is a critical part of enabling the social worker to provide a much more evidence-based and objective report on risk and need. Without it, we are entirely reliant on the offender's version of events. There may be important information missing from that, particularly in relation to victims. So what we can learn from that is that summaries of court evidence will be critical to an objective and accurate risk assessment, and without it, the social workers are effectively flying blind with no access to information about how the decisions might affect victims and uh, that they're taking the main source of information from apparently the offenders themselves. Now, colleagues will recall that uh, this was a recommendation uh, in our stage one report, recommendation 182 said, and again I'll quote, the committee calls on the Scottish Government to explore with the Scottish Courts and Tribunal Service how to more routinely supply criminal justice social workers with summaries of evidence from court cases to inform the preparation of any risk assessments. Such summaries would help for both pre-sentence reports and reports issued prior to release from a custodial sentence. So, my Amendment 78, uh, which I hereby move, seeks to give effect to that recommendation to ensure that social workers have as much evidence as practicable in front of them before making crucial risk assessments, and, uh, which will inform judges' decisions. John Finney. Thank you very much. Um, that, that was a unanimous recommendation in our report, as I, I recall, and, and, and certainly there is, there is merit in it. Um, my concern is that um, who does the summary, in a way? Uh, um, what status does that summary have? And I'm trying to envisage a situation where we would know there's a busy court and there might, ideally, there should in any case be a criminal justice social worker in the court, their capacity to do that. Um, I'm also interested in what the status of that um, summary might be. I don't know if Mr Kerr can help us with that. And for instance, would it be open to challenge? It would have significant impact on the individual to whom it refers. So I, um, I, I'm... You know, on first reading, I went, that's a good idea. It's important that everyone has the maximum information around which to make an informed decision. But it's the mechanics of it that I'm very interested in. And at this stage, I'll keep my position open, pending hopefully hearing from Mr Kerr on some of these matters. Thank you. Daniel Johnson. Thank you, Convener. I'd just like to speak in support of this amendment. I think uh, when we consider the, the findings of uh, both HMICS and HMICS uh, uh, following the, the tragic events around Craig McClellan, the... the, the uh, uh, an important point of information sharing was at the forefront of both of those reports. And I think that it's vital um, throughout the criminal justice system that we uh, have all relevant information available to those making decisions. And it strikes me that having taken the time in a, a court to carefully examine evidence, to not then use that evidence subsequently, I think is, is a, a mistake. And indeed, I think this is very much in line with uh, uh, one of my uh, later amendments, which looks at the, the, whether or not uh, bail was granted and, and subsequent decisions. And that fo follows from uh, exactly the same insight that that careful deliberation and examination of facts should be made available uh, and, and should uh, continue to inform decision-making uh, subsequently in the process. Lee MacArthur. 
Thanks very much. Um, can I just start by thanking <coughs> Liam Kerr for lodging the amendment? As he says, it, it does reflect the, the uh, conclusion, the recommendation we made in the Stage 1 report. I suppose a little like John Finney, the, the practicalities of, of how this is delivered um, are, are of interest. I mean, I'm sure of interest to, to all of the committee, but I think we've got an opportunity, having had the amendment lodged at Stage 2, that if there are things that need to be done to adjust it, to make it either clearer where the responsibility lies or to ensure that the way in which it's applied is not overly onerous on, on, on those who are already working to, 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 um, to, to, to kind of heavy workloads, um, that would seem to me to be time well spent. So I, mean, I look forward to hearing what the Cabinet Secretary has to say. But again, thank Liam Kerr for, for lodging the amendment at this stage. Rona. Thank you, Convener. Yes, um, while I accept that Liam Kerr's amendment is well-meaning, um, I think I agree with um, John Finney and Liam MacArthur. It's just uh, the mechanics of it that would um, worry me. I don't think the, it's a bit ambiguous. The purpose isn't terribly clear. Um, and it would place an enormous burden on the Scottish Courts and Tribunal Service who, who, who you know, it would, it would cost them, it would be time-consuming. And how would they identify what local authority is relevant? There's, there's, there's an awful burden being put on them. Um, and I think until, you know, there's more clarity about this, I, I, I couldn't support it. Yeah, um, uh, like, like my colleagues to, to my left and to uh, uh, Rona, I, I kind of feel that the, the main issue with this is in terms of the practicalities and the mechanism, but I think it would also be remiss of me not to say, uh, as a previous criminal justice social worker, that while that, I accept that's a quote directly from James maybe, I do feel that it's, it's perhaps not representative of what he was trying to say at that point, and I, and I and, you know, I think it did come out in the evidence sessions and uh, and, the, and through the report that there's um, a lot more to a criminal justice social work assessment than solely um, hearing the, the individual's um, views, which is an important part of it. But um, I think I made the point several times that there was other parts to the assessment. So I, I think the, 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 the amendment's definitely well-meaning and um, I appreciate that you know it, it's it, it's to support social work um, staff out there, but I think again uh, there might be unintended consequences, and it might end up not being supportive um, to the social work staff who are doing the assessment. So I'd like to hear the cabinet secretary's uh, views on that before coming to a full decision. But at this point, I'm inclined to, to not vote for it. Okay. Um, it seems to me that to to have a summary of the evidence presented during the case made available to the local the relevant local authority is eminently sensible and it does then implement what this committee recommended in its stage one report. However, I look forward to hearing what the Cabinet Secretary says. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, uh, Convener. Can I also echo what other members have said, that um, uh, the, the, the intention behind Liam Kerr's uh, amendment uh, is, is an admirable one uh, and, and is one I think we could coalesce uh, around. My concern and, and, and why the government can support is because of the mechanics, the process, the reason that um, the reasons that uh, Rona Mackay, Fulton, John Finney and, and Lee MacArthur uh, have asked about. And of course, I'll go into them in, in a little bit more detail, but perhaps it's worth starting uh, just where you did, Convener, at Group 1. Uh, your phrase was, that, and, and I quote exactly, that the law should be precise. Um, this amendment uh, is not precise, and that is where we have uh, some challenges and some difficulty, despite, and let me say it again, the, the very good intention uh, of Liam Kerr's uh, amendment. Um, I suppose on the mechanics, uh, any new information sharing arrangements uh, that are being created within the justice system uh, also need to demonstrate clear benefits uh, relative to the cost of putting them in place, but at present there, there is no mechanism across all court business for routinely collecting and transmitting such evidence from a court. What would that summary of evidence uh, look like? Uh, the Scottish Courts and Tribunal Service have commented uh, on this uh, amendment, uh, noting uh, that while it may be costly for them, potentially time consuming for the judiciary, they have, uh, they have to participate in such a process. But they've also said that there may be other mechanisms which may be more proportionate for the occasions where it is required. For example, dialogue with court-based social workers may achieve uh, the same uh, effects. Uh, in practical terms, I'd also note that it's not clear how the court would be able to identify which local authority is, quote-unquote, the relevant authority at the time of sentencing. Um, yes? Um, it's, it's on the previous point you made there, Cabinet Secretary, about the, the opportunity for a court-based social worker uh, to, to be involved. Of course, the reality is, and we saw that at uh, 
um, Edinburgh Sheriff Court, there isn't a, a criminal justice social worker in attendance at every trial. So it would require a, a tremendous measure of coordination, which might indeed put a further challenge on the many challenges about coordination that already exist in our criminal justice system. So it's not that there is a criminal justice social worker in every court anyway, as I would understand. Yes, and I think the point that I'm trying to make is that there'll be many, and I'll come on this point shortly, that it may not be the case that it is needed for every single case that comes in front of the court, that that summary of evidence would be required, but it may be certain cases where it's, it's, it's needed. Um, and I was going to say this at the summing up of, or the conclusion of, 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 of my remarks. I think you know there is clearly an understandable sense from some quarters in social work uh, that having a, a readout of the evidence or having further information could be very helpful to them. I think we should work uh, together to find the right formulation, both as parliamentarians, but also with the, the institutions, namely the Scottish Courts Tribunal Service, to try to find what that appropriate process uh, would be. It's also quite important for me to put on, on, on record the fact that um, it's crucial that we're talking about the process of, of, of risk assessment uh, that were led by the considerations of the Risk Management Authority uh, as to what information is the most relevant. Um, accordingly, I suppose as parlamentar parliamentarians, we need to be cautious about not preempting those considerations and to John Finney's point, predetermining the information which is to be considered uh, as having a bearing uh, on risk. We need to avoid prescribing um, information which may not be required by those tasked with making decisions on electronic monitoring uh, or which is irrelevant or detrimental to the decision uh, that they're tasked with making. Um, the amendment, as it currently stands, would cut across all forms of court-imposed electronic uh, monitoring. A social work report is prepared for the court when considering the imposition of a, a RLO, Restriction of uh, Liberty Order. So social work will be aware of the background of those cases uh, anyway. There seems very limited merit, uh, therefore, in requiring the court to provide information to a local authority, which is, they will likely be aware of um, uh, already. In addition, social work involvement in monitoring an individual serving a community sentence um, will vary depending on particular community sentence imposed. For example, there's no requirement for a supervising officer to be appointed by a local authority for an individual sentence in RLO. The provision of a summary of evidence in those circumstances would then clearly be a relatively pointless um, exercise. So, uh, as I say, the amendment both the mechanics of it and, and, and some of the lack of perhaps precision, because it cuts across all court business, uh, for me is is, is concerning. Uh, I do think it's well intentioned. Uh, I would ask Liam Kerr not to press the amendment to work with us um, and, and other other partners that are interested in stakeholders um, to see if we can get to, to a position that we can agree on at stage three. But if he does choose to press his amendment, then um, I would ask other members to consider rejecting it for the reasons I've outlined. Sure. Like, before you <laughs> Why finish. Not? Presumably, if I press it, though, just as a point of um, process, if I press it, that doesn't, and, and it gets voted down, it doesn't preclude us working together at stage three to make it. Sure. I'm always opening, open to working together with Liam Kerr uh, and other members uh, of the committee. So, yes, you, you can choose to press it and uh, um, we'll see what happens. But, of course, my, my offer, regardless of whether, you, whether it gets defeated or not, to work with you on this matter is, is, an, is an open one. I'm very grateful. Liam Kerr to wind up, press or withdraw? Uh, thank you, uh, convener. Uh, and uh, uh, my genuine thanks to all the members in the Cabinet Secretary for the uh, thoughts and comments there. Um, just to deal with a few of the concerns that were raised, I, I, I'm not convinced the purpose isn't clear, Rona Mackay. I, I think the, the purpose behind this is uh, completely clear. Um, in terms of the court processes, Mr Finney, it's, I, I can't see that it's beyond the wit of man. Um, to make this work uh, in a court. And uh, you talk about the court-based social worker. Uh, we, we, we can do this. This is possible. Now, I accept and I understand the point about resourcing. I, I see where, where that comes from. Uh, but members will be uh, aware that I have proposed an Amendment 76 later on, which deals specifically with the resourcing of this bill. Um, and uh, I, I have no doubt that members will be looking forward to voting for that later on. And as a function of that going through, the resourcing will be there that will allow uh, this process to be brought forward. Um, the, the status, Mr Finney, I, I, again, I, I hear the point being made, but I think this is about assisting all parties to ensure fairness to, to all, to, to the accused, to, to the um, the relevant person, the offender, uh, but also to ensure that social workers are fully resourced uh, 
and also to pick up on James Maybe's point about the information being missing on victims. I, I think there's a, a real concern here that we, we focus an awful lot on offenders. Yes, of course. Uh, for the avoidance of doubt, uh, you know, I, I am supportive of the direction of travel, but as ever, I'm very interested in the practicalities. On the status that would have, would it be open to the individual whom the report's about to challenge it? Would it be open to, for instance, a victim to challenge it? I think you're right that there are technical solutions that are possible. Uh, who would compile the report, though? That's what I would like. Well, I think um, I'm grateful for the intervention. I, th I think the uh, point is that the court, uh, you're quite right, we need to work that out as part of a process. But the principle uh, that there needs to be almost a quality of arms between the offender, the victim, the social work, uh, to make sure that we come to the best decisions and the right resourcing decisions uh, once this process is uh, going forward. Um, the final challenge that uh, I face was from uh, Fulton McGregor and, uh, about this, this might not be helpful to the social work staff. Uh, and I want to pick up, I attach particular weight to Mr McGregor's comments uh, simply because of his, his background. I was particularly interested to hear what he has to say. What I would suggest in, in response, though, is that James Maybe was, was very clear that because they're lacking summaries at the moment, uh, the, the social work is effectively flying blind. Uh, it seems to me this will help. This amendment will help. It will improve the system, of course. I'm just wondering when you're saying that, if, um, William Kieran, uh, and thank you for taking the intervention, if you had any discussions with uh, Social Work Scotland or any other social workers or relevant agencies about this particular amendment, um, taking it into today's debate? Uh, the answer to your question is no, um, which is why I attach particular weight to your own contribution, Mr McGregor. Um, but also, of course, I refer back to the evidence that we heard in session, the recommendation that this committee unanimously came to to put this forward as an amendment. So I'm simply bringing forward the view of the committee, in my view, uh, because this will help, this will address the very key point that James may be made uh, to ensure that social work isn't flying blind. This will help them, therefore we should do it. And I move the amendment in my name. Okay, the question is amendment seven uh, to eight be agreed to. Are we all agreed? No. Uh, sorry, yeah? Amendment 78. Yeah, 78. No, no, 78. <laughs> That's the way I say it. <laughs> 78 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? No. No. Um, will there will be a division. All those in favour, please show. Okay. All those against, please show. No abstentions. Four in favour, five against. Four in favour, five against. Uh, the amendment is not agreed. Call amendment eight in the name of Daniel Johnson, already debated with amendment uh, two. Daniel Johnson, to move or not move? Moved, Commissioner. Move. Um, the question is, amendment eight be agreed to? Are we all agreed? No, we are not all agreed. Um, those in favour, please show. Those against? Seven in favour, two against. Amendment is agreed. Uh, the question is that section one be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes, we are all agreed. Call amendment 9, 10, 11 and 12 all in the name of Daniel Johnson and all previously debated. Daniel Johnson to move amendments 9 to 12 on block. Moved. Do, uh, does any member object to a single question being put on amendments 9 to 12? No. Nope. The question is, therefore, that amendments 9 to 12 are agreed. Are we all agreed? We are not all agreed. Um, those in favour, please show. Those against? 
7.2, these uh, amendments are agreed to. The question is that section 2 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. Yep. Call amendment 81 in the name of the Cabinet Secretary, group with amendments 82 and 83. Cabinet Secretary to move amendment 81 and speak to all amendments in the group. Uh, thank you, uh, convener. I move uh, Amendment 81 uh, in, my, uh, in my name. Amendment 81 will introduce electronic monitoring for supervised release orders, SROs. Uh, these orders are a combination of court-imposed supervisions alongside uh, early release. Uh, previously, they were not one of the court disposals listed in Section 3 of the Bill, uh, and they were not uh, one of the various forms of licence conditions which could attract an electronic monitoring requirement as listed in Section 7 of the Bill. Um, an individual subject to an SRO is released with the supervision requirement and licence condi conditions set by the court. Uh, therefore, it would be appropriate for SROs to be added to the list in Section 3 of the Bill so that the court could impose an electronic monitoring requirement. Uh, this will enable an SRO containing a movement restriction to be electronically monitored in the same way uh, as a movement restriction in any other form of early, early uh, release licence, uh, parole, HDC, temporary release, etc. Uh, amendments 82 and 83 amend section 3 of the bill to remove all references to quasi-criminal sexual offences prevention orders and sexual harm prevention orders. Um, this bill is aimed solely at criminal proceedings and brings all existing powers to impose electronic monitoring and criminal proceedings into one statutory provision. The policy intention is that the bill does not extend to orders given out with criminal proceedings uh, as different safeguards and oversights apply to criminal and civil orders, uh, including the duration for which uh, any monitoring may apply. This amendment makes it clear that for orders which can be opposed in criminal proceedings or on application by a chief constable, that it's only those orders that go through criminal proceedings route to which the bill applies. Uh, this is an important clarification so that the legislation as a single statutory provision for electronic monitoring and criminal proceedings does not inadvertently cast any doubt on the ability of any court to proceed with whatever existing powers they may have to undertake electronic monitoring. It is not the intention uh, to insinuate that the court has no power to impose uh, electronic monitoring in civil proceedings simply by excluding all civil orders from the list in Section 3 of the Bill. Uh, rather, the Bill makes no, no changes to the existing powers available uh, to civil courts when imposing movement restrictions on an individual uh, where these powers would enable the civil courts to order the electronic monitoring uh, of those movement restrictions. Uh, the civil court, of course, should retain uh, that discretion. So I move Amendment 81 uh, in my name. Always at a last moment, but of course I'm happy Sorry, to do just so. Sorry, seeing if you develop the point, Cabinet Secretary. Just on that <coughs> 82, uh, Amendment 82 and 83, uh, just for my own clarity, if I may, I, I understood what you were saying, that the, um, the SOPOs and the SHPOs are, are covered by different legislation. Uh, but is the practical effect of removing them from this legislation that, uh, for example, those subject to those orders, uh, there may be more uh, sexual offenders uh, out on licence or some such uh, who are not subject to electronic monitoring? Is, it, is there... In, in its practical impact, is there a reduction in the protection of the public by these changes? I appreciate Liam Kerr uh, asking that question. I think it's a really important one. Uh, no would be the answer. There's no diminution, no uh, degradation uh, or, or any detrimental effect um, in terms of the, the, the protection of the public because of what we're doing, as you rightly point out in asking the question. Uh, and I've, I hope I, I touched upon this in, in, in my own remarks. Um, there is, of course, uh, the, 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 we're not casting any doubt on the ability of any court to proceed uh, uh, to, with whatever existing powers they have. There is already um, legislation in place uh, to, 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 to cover the restrictions uh, of those orders, um, those quasi-criminal uh, orders. But uh, if the member uh, wants, uh, or the com committee indeed, uh, needs any further reassurances of that, of course I can provide that in writing. But I'm happy to put on the record that uh, uh, what I'm doing here does not uh, uh, decrease the practical impact or effects of, of SOPOs or SHPOs. Okay, I think that's an important point, um, Cabinet Secretary, just that we have on the record that it wouldn't um, adversely affect the monitoring of sexual offenders, either of these uh, amendments in that case. Any other members want to comment? In which case, then, the question is that Amendment 1, uh, sorry, 81, be agreed to? Are we all agreed? 
Yes. We are all agreed. Call Amendment 82, enable the Cabinet Secretary already debated with Amendment 81, Cabinet Secretary, to move formally. To move. Uh, the question is that Amendment 82 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are agreed. Call Amendment 83, in the name of the Cabinet Secretary, already debated with Amendment 1, Cabinet Secretary, to move formally. Moved. Right. The question is that Amendment 83 be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are all agreed. The question is that Section 3 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are all agreed. Called Amendment 13, 14, 15 and 16, all in the name of Daniel Johnson and previously debated. Daniel Johnson to move Amendments 13 to 16 on block. Moved on block. Does any member object to a single question being put on Amendments <coughs> 13 to 17? No. Uh, the que uh, sorry. 13 to 16. The question is that amendments 13 to 16 are agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are not all agreed. There will be a division. Those in favour, please show. Those against? 7, two, uh, seven four, two against. Uh, these amendments are agreed. Call Amendment 84 in the name of the Cabinet Secretary, good, grouped with amendments as shown in the groupings. Amendment 95 preempts Amendment 58 in the group. Part 1, terminology, relevant person. Amendment 99 preempts Amendment 59 in the group. Part 1, terminology, relevant persons. Cabinet Secretary to move Amendment 84 and speak to all the amendments in the group. Thank you. Move uh, Amendment 84 in my name, and I'll speak to the, the, the other amendments as briefly as I possibly can. These are, are minor, minor technical amendments which are designed to provide additional clarification on some of the language that's used in the bill. They make no substantive uh, change to the operation of the provisions, but uh, I think they're quite useful for clear and full understanding of what the provisions say uh, and do. In terms of Amendments 84, 85, 86 and 96, um, there are various references in Part 1 of the bill to movement restrictions. And the amendments I've just touched upon clarify those references to state that movement restrictions include being at or not being at a particular place. Uh, amendment 87, section uh, 8, subsection 2 of the bill describes the types of devices that may be specified as approved devices. Amendment 87 provides that this would include <coughs> devices which me measure the levels of alcohol, drugs or other substances taken by the offender rather than just measuring the presence of alcohol, drugs or other substances in the offender's body. Uh, this ties with Amendment 98, uh, which I will come to uh, shortly. Amendment 88 uh, adds a further subsection to Section 8 of the Bill, which provides that any apparatus linked to the approved device can also be prescribed as an approved device under Section 8, uh, subsection 1. Uh, this will ensure there can be no doubt as to the legitimacy of using uh, an RF uh, radio frequency box, for example, alongside an electronic tag. Amendment 89, Section 9, Subsection 3 of the Bill provides that regulations made under Section 9 may set out how a device is worn or used by the offender. Uh, my Amendment 89 provides that regulations may set out how or when a device is to be worn or used. And um, this is to provide for circumstances when the monitoring requirement can become uh, maybe intermittent. Um, Amendment 91, section 12, subsection 2 of the bill provides that an offender must obey the instructions of the designated person on how a device is to be worn or used. Amendment 91 provides... Yes, I will. In particular, uh, Amendments 90 and 91, in terms of, uh, uh, kind of increasing, uh, improving the specificity um, of the, the wearing of the device. I mean, there is some concern about offenders cutting these devices off or tampering with them in other ways. Will this improve the ability to respond to uh, those instances, especially when that is, an, an, you know, is the the intention of the individual to tamper with the, the device in such a way to, to evade uh, the restrictions that, that the monitoring is supposed to place on the individual? Yeah, um, well, a couple of things. One, I'll probably come to that specific point when Liam Kerr comes to his amendments on the, the, the issue of cutting off a tag or, or, or tampering uh, with a tag and, again, some of the unintended consequences uh, around that. Now, in terms of my own amendments, both 90 and, and, and 91, um, the change of language really is more so to provide uh, sufficient flexibility in how the monitoring might give effect. Uh, a designated person may need to provide instruction 
on intermittent, mon intermittent monitoring. Um, so there shouldn't be uh, an effect on, on, on whether or not, for example, that individual looks to cut off the tag or, or, or tamper with the tag. Um, but again, I can come to that at, at a later point uh, when, when, when Liam Kerr uh, will be moving uh, his, mo uh, his, his amendments in that regard. But it, but it shouldn't have uh, the effect that I think Daniel Johnson is, is, is concerned about in that regard. Um, if I may make, make progress on uh, the other technical amendments, Amendment 92, um, that adds a further subsection to Section 12, clarifying that the obligations to wear, use and refrain from tampering with damaging the device uh, includes apparatus linked to the device. Um, Amendment 94, um, Section 14, uh, subsection 3 of the Bill states the evidence of a breach may be given by way of an automated document containing relevant information. Uh, section 14.4 states that this includes specific types of information. Amendment 94 changes Section 14.4 to state that examples are specific types of information. This is just a minor change for sense um, in, in, in the wording of Section 14. Amendment 95. Section 14.4 of the bill refers to information about the offender's whereabouts at a particular time. Amendment 95 changes this to the device's whereabouts. Um, this is to reflect the logic that the automated uh, evidence is of the device's whereabouts rather than uh, the offender's uh, whereabouts. Although, as a matter of fact, the latter will often obviously be easily shown uh, by or inferred uh, from, from the former. Uh, Amendment 97, Section 14.4 states the type of information that can be included in an automated statement from the device. Uh, Amendment 97 adds to the list the connectivity or working of the device and the wearing or the use of the device at a particular time. Uh, coupled with information about the device's whereabouts, this should assist in showing that the offender was wearing the device uh, at the time. Uh, Amendment 98, Section 14.4b provides that automated information includes the presence of alcohol, etc., in the offender's body. Uh, Amendment 98 provides that the automated evidence can include the presence or level of alcohol, etc. This ties in with Amendment 87 that I explained uh, earlier on. Uh, Amendment 99, uh, Section 14.4b, provides that automated information includes the presence of alcohol uh, and so on in the offender's body. Amendment 99 clarifies this to state that the automated evidence will be the presence of alcohol in the wearer or user's body. Uh, this is to reflect the logic that the automated evidence is of the consumption of whoever is wearing the device, although it will often, again, be easily shown or inferred from the related fact that this is obviously indeed the, the, the offender. Uh, Amendment uh, 100 is a minor correction of A to the at the start of Section 14.6c uh, of the Bill. Um, that summarises the proposed changes made throughout these amendments, uh, as I say, they're merely for improved understanding of how the monitoring system is intended to work, with little substantive or practical um, effect, uh, actually, and to note the concerns raised by Daniel Johnson. Again, I can perhaps come to them in a little more detail in, 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 in for the future uh, amendments. So I move Amendment 84 in my name. Um, do members have any other comments on these amendments? I wonder, Cabinet Secretary, if you could clarify just again what 93 does. Um, just for the avoidance of doubt, does this, it appears to allow non-compliant um, uh, compliant prisoners to avoid recall to custody. Is that the case? Which one? Because so, I wasn't moving in Amendment 93. Oh, it's not in that grouping. I apologies. My ah, apologies. Sorry. Okay. Um, do, <laughs> do you have any anything further to say, Cabinet Secretary? No. The question is that Amendment 84 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Agreed. We are agreed. Okay. Call Amendment 17 in the name of Daniel Johnson. Already debated with Amendment 2. Daniel Johnson to move or not move? Uh, moved. Moved. Uh, the question is that Amendment 17 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? agreed. Oh, we are not all agreed. Those in favour, please show. Okay, those against? Seven in favour, two against. Uh, the amendment is agreed. The question is that Section 4 be agreed. Are we all agreed? Agreed. Call amendments 18 to 25, all in the name of Daniel Johnson, all previously debated. Daniel Johnson to move amendments 18 to 25 on block. Moved on block. Does any member object to a single question being put in amendments 18 to 25? No. The question is that amendments 18 to 25 are agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. No, we are not all agreed. Those in favour, please show. 
Those against, please show. 7-2, these amendments are agreed. The question is, Section 5 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. Call amendments 26 to 28 in the name of Daniel Johnson, all previously debated. Daniel Johnson to move amendments 26 to 28 on block. Moved on block. Does any member object to a single question being put on amendments 26 to 28? No. The question is that amendments 26 to 28 are, are agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. No. We are not all agreed. Those in favour, please show. Those against. 7 2, these amendments are agreed to. The question is that section 6 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. Call amendment 29 in the name of Daniel Johnson, already debated with amendment 2. Daniel Johnson to move or not move? Uh, move. Um, the question is that amendment 29 be agreed to. Are we all, are all agreed? Yes. No. Uh, we are not all agreed. Uh, those in favour, please show. Those against? 7 2, these amendments are agreed to. Call amendment 85 in the name of the Cabinet Secretary, already debated with amendment 84. Cabinet Secretary to move formally. Moved. The question is that amendment 85 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are all agreed. Call amendment 30 in the name of Daniel Gen Johnson, already debated with amendment 2. Daniel Johnson to move or not move? Move. Move. The question is amendment 30 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are not all agreed. Those in favour, please show. Those against? 7-2, these uh, amendment uh, 30, amendment 30 is agreed. Uh, the question is that section 7 be agreed to, are we all agreed? Yes. Yes, that is agreed. Call amendment 31 in the name of Daniel Johnson, grouped with man, amendment 131. Daniel Johnson to move amendment 31 and speak to both amendments in the group. Thank you, Convener, and I move Amendment 31 in my name. Uh, both of these amendments in this group uh, arise from the same insight and one that I alluded to earlier on uh, in terms of the, the debate to one of Liam Kerr's previous points, and that is around information sharing. Um, the HMIPS report in particular was very clear and robust about the issues around information sharing uh, with regard to the tragic uh, 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 events around Craig McClellan's death. Uh, and in that report in particular, and I quote, it stated that whilst assessment processes clearly existed, uh, uh, sorry, whilst an assessment process clearly existed, it may not be regarded by some to meet the definition of robust. It went on to say that those making the decisions to release an individual on in HTC uh, do not have access to intelligence held by Police Scotland, nor is it easy for them to access information regarding any outstanding charges or ongoing investigations uh, relating to the HDC application. This situation makes it difficult uh, uh, to come to an informed decision about an individual's overall suitability for HDC. It then went on to make the recommendation um, that the, the, the person charged with making decisions to release someone in HDC should have access uh, to information and intelligence held by Police Scotland, uh, Scor Scottish Courts and Tribunal Service uh, and the, uh, the Crown Office and Procurator Fiscal Service prior to making those decisions. Fundamentally, what uh, Amendment 31 does is ensure that there's an illegal obligation on those agencies and bodies to share exactly that information uh, with SPS and the therefore the individuals uh, making the decision as to whether or not to, uh, to, to, to grant someone HDC. Therefore, I think it's a fundamental importance, and I think it's important to put that in law so that the situation that arose in those tragic circumstances cannot happen again. And indeed, there is a legal obligation and a legal requirement for those agencies to do exactly that and share that information as uh, the, the inspector of prisons uh, recommended. Likewise, 131 uh, relates to decisions made uh, in the court process regarding an individual. And it strikes me um, that very, uh, many of the, the considerations um, relevant to the decision regarding whether or not to grant an HDC are very similar to the sorts of decisions that are uh, required when uh, the decision is made whether or not to grant bail or to remand uh, someone uh, 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 appearing on charges, i.e. Uh, looking at whether or not that person is a risk and that there are issues or concerns that, that may be relevant. And indeed, I think we should acknowledge that 
that those circumstances and those situations can, of course, change. There is obviously going to be a period of time spent um, in, in prison or in another context in which that person can reform. So that is not to say that that cannot happen, but it is clearly of relevance whether or not a, a judge or sheriff uh, made a decision whether or not to, to, to bail or remand someone in those circumstances when someone is making a decision about HDC. Now, I, I say that, uh, albeit that I, I recognise that there are issues around the use of remand in Scotland, uh, and, I, and I would like to explore that further uh, uh, in, uh, while we're considering these amendments. But that all being said, I think we should have regard to the information and evidence used by the courts when we're establishing risk uh, with, uh, uh, relevant to granting HDC and more broadly in terms of electronic tagging, and I think that's important. So uh, I would hope that uh, other members will uh, consider those issues when looking at these amendments. Do members have any questions or comments? Cabinet Secretary. Uh, Fulton, sorry. Hey, thanks, Convener. Yeah, I mean, I, I've got um, quite a lot of sympathy with uh, this amendment, but a, a, a wee bit like uh, Liam Kerr's uh, previous one, uh, and if it's a probing one, I apologise uh, for, for what I'm going to say, <laughs> but if, if it's intended as a probing amendment, but I think it probably needs um, a wee bit more work. Um, in terms of what information would be shared, uh, what information would be relevant to be shared, um, because I, I, I don't see any of that detail here. And I think that's actually quite a complicated landscape. We would need to, to look at a lot more, uh, you know, a, a, a lot more closely, uh, human rights and their uh, data protection, uh, sharing of information, because it's not just as simple as every, every bit of information would be relevant. So I'd be interested to hear what the, the Cabinet Secretary says, but I think it's a, an amendment that's certainly got merit, but I don't know if it's uh, enough for me at this stage. And whether, if it's a proven amendment, as I say, then fair enough, it's maybe something to bring back at stage three. Right. It does seem to me that um, these amendments do make the process of early release more robust, but uh, Liam Kerr. Yeah, just to endorse that comment, I think these are good amendments, uh, personally. I, I hear what Fulton McGregor says, uh, of course, but uh, I respectfully disagree. I think there's uh, plenty in there. I think it does make the process more robust, and I'll be looking forward to supporting it. Cabinet Secretary. Thank you very much. Uh, I once again thank Daniel Johnson uh, for bringing these amendments uh, to, to committee at uh, this stage to debate. Um, uh, my concerns uh, around both amendments, and I'll obviously go into them in a bit more detail, um, are, are around uh, the, the drafting uh, of them, but also, again, the unintended uh, consequences that they may well have and whether actually they're, they're necessary uh, or, or, or not. So I'll try to touch upon those points uh, as briefly uh, as I possibly can. If I turn to Amendment 31, um, a key consideration uh, here is that the sharing of information between criminal justice organisations um, can, where appropriate, assist those organisations in making decisions in relation to an individual, both pre- and, and, and post-conviction. Uh, as I say, is whether that is necessary. I mean, all of the bodies in Amendment 31 already routinely feed information into the HDC's decision-making process. Uh, the information currently shared with Scottish ministers by the Scottish Courts and Tribunal Service for the purposes of HDC includes, for example, a copy uh, of any social work report, uh, a psychiatric report, if, if, if necessary in, this case, in that case, uh, that was made, made available to the court. Uh, the police share information, which now, as a result of the review on, on HDC, now includes intelligence information uh, relating to serious organised crime links. Uh, social work routinely feed into the HDC to release decision-making processes particularly through the role and assessment of the home environment into which the individual will be released. Uh, given the breadth of information that's already shared uh, between criminal justice organisations for the purpose of HDC, I'm not convinced that a statutory obligation uh, is required. There are also some concerns about the drafting of Amendment 31. Uh, firstly, the amendment as it's drafted would only require Scottish ministers to request information prior to releasing a prisoner on HDC. There's no obligation to wait for a response or to consider the information provided, although I accept that it's no doubt implied from the underlying terms of the amendment. It's not specific or precise. Um, secondly, the description of the information that's to be requested uh, is very, very wide, as mentioned by Fulton McGregor. Um, any information relevant to the monitoring of the prisoner, it's not clear what specific information should be requested um, by the Scottish Government or what information should be provided by the relevant organisations. 
when it comes to, um, so while I respect um, the, the, the intent of, of, of 31, uh, I'd, I'd ask for the amendment not to be pressed. I'd be happy, of course, as always, to work with the member in advance to stay to give reassurances where I can. Um, of course. Mm. Thankful uh, for the Cabinet Secretary taking intervention. I, I got the impression in responding earlier to Liam Kerr's amendment about social work uh, reports um, that he wasn't minded necessarily to, to frame an alternative amendment um, to, the, to the legislation. I get the impression from what he's saying here that the language is potential, could potentially be tightened up to address the concerns um, that he's, uh, he's outlined. Is that, is that the case? Is, is, is it more a question of the phraseology and, and, and the precision of the amendment, rather than the fact that you don't believe that this is, is best is best put into onto the face of the bill. It's, it's, it's the necessity and the precision uh, of, 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 of the wording uh, as well. I'm, I'm not convinced about the necessity for it because of what I've already shared. There's a lot of work going on around the risk management. But if I put that to side, then, then certainly the the, the the, the language, the unintended consequences, the technical drafting of it gives me concern. Um, what I'd be happy to do is engage in dialogue in advance of stage three to give reassurances, but it may well be, despite those reassurances, members still want to bring um, uh, amendments uh, forward at stage three, but hopefully at least having that discussion in advance of stage three will help to inform any potential amendments that um, that, that come forward uh, th 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 thereafter. If I'll quickly just touch upon uh, amendment uh, 131, uh, the decision to release or refuse to release someone on bail is obviously taken at uh, a different point in time by a different person for a different purpose and using different information compared with the decision to release someone on HDC. Uh, someone may not be granted bail because, um, just to take one example, they've been assessed to be a risk of non-appearance at court. That's uh, maybe because they have a chaotic lifestyle at a time that... We, and that's a very different judgment to somebody um, to determine whether somebody, for example, is a risk of, of harm. Uh, these are really crucial and important differences. Mm -hmm. I'm yep. grateful for the Cabinet Secretary taking that intervention. Would the Cabinet Secretary nonetheless acknowledge that someone's uh, propensity to, uh, to disregard previous bail conditions should be an important factor in the overall assessment? Yes, uh, I accept the point that John Finney makes. Uh, I suppose the point I'm trying to make is that there are different, uh, different considerations that have to be taken depending on whether it's bail versus uh, any other um, um, monitoring that may well take place. And I think these are important to not just put on the record, but to, to recognise. I'm not convinced that Amendment 131 recognises um, that. If he wants to come back in, I'll allow him to, but I've got a... I, I'm grateful, yes. I, I was talking about a history, a pattern of uh, not adhering to bail conditions, which ultimately results in a, a, a custodial sentence. At some time, there might be consideration given to early release and home detention. Surely it would be a factor. The, the, I mean, I'm not saying it shouldn't apply, that the, the person shouldn't be, should be refused previously for, simply for previously having offended against bail, but it is relevant. Yes, uh, again, I, I don't doubt what he says and I don't take away from what John Finney says that it's, it's, it's relevant, but again, there are different considerations. Not everybody, of course, will have a pattern because it may be the first time, of course, they are uh, in front of the courts. Notwithstanding all of that, John Finney's point on the record is, is, is an important one. I think, I suppose, the final point I'd make on, 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 on Amendment 131, um, any decision by... Uh, the substantive point I would try to make is that in any um, decision by a public authority must be made in light of, of the relevant information and information that's relevant, uh, that is, sorry, irrelevant um, to the matter at hand should frankly be disregarded. Amendment 131 risks placing an obligation on Scottish ministers to consider information that in many circumstances may be irrelevant to the decision to release a prisoner on HDC. This could potentially leave a decision to uh, release, refuse uh, HDC at risk of, of, of legal challenge. Uh, moreover, it would replace, uh, also place, I should say, an administrative burden, also a financial burden on Scottish Courts and Tribunal Service, and collecting the data as it would be likely to involve time from a judicial member uh, and recording this in a transmittable form. Um, so then accordingly, I'd ask that Amendment 131 uh, is not pressed, and if pressed, uh, I would urge the committee to, to, to reject. So um, in, in, in summary, both amendments 31 and 131. Um, I believe we should allow the work that's currently underway with justice partners looking at HCC guidance and governance to conclude uh, and should be led by the Risk Management Authority. Um, they are the body that can best provide the advice as to the factors uh, that have the greatest relationship to risk. 
um, and prescribing what information should be um, first is not, in my view, the correct uh, approach. Uh, I would say to Mr Johnson, I recognise the desire to have some ongoing parliamentary involvement uh, in these issues. We're not due to discuss uh, the convener's um, amendment, uh, number, number, uh, amendment 130, which seeks to oblige Scottish ministers to prepare statutory guidance on HCC and have it laid before the Parliament. And I have to say I'm minded to support that amendment, and if Ms. Johnson, uh, Mr Johnson is content not to press his amendment here today, then I'm happy to work with him uh, and the convener uh, on that amendment to find a form of words that sets out what HDC guidance should cover uh, in terms of information exchange. Daniel Johnson to wind up. Press or withdraw. Um, Thank you very much, Convener. Let me deal with Amendment 131 first and then come to uh, 31. Uh, I mean, I recognise much of, of what the Cabinet Secretary uh, says in 131. I think there is a broad principle here, though, and I think one that the, the committee, I think, has uh, encountered and a number of uh, times where there are decisions and, indeed, information available to the courts, which then is subsequently uh, not accessible uh, uh, by uh, subsequent decision makers. And I think there is a point there that, that does need to be addressed. I recognise that is a much more complicated process than perhaps uh, Amendment 131 sets out. Um, so therefore, uh, at that relevant point, I won't be pressing uh, Amendment uh, 131 on that basis. However, the Cabinet Secretary did just mention one thing, which was you know, the need to bear in mind the Risk Management Authority were looking at risk factors. So turning to 31 and the, the, the issues raised about the broadly stated nature of that, the reason that that amendment is broadly stated is exactly for that reason. I think it is important that legislation is flexible. I think putting specific risk factors on the face of the bill and in black letter law would be an error. And that is precisely why uh, that amendment is, is structured as is with subsection four, which has allowed Scottish ministers by regulation to make further provision for the purposes and connection of this section. And that is precisely so that ministers can specify in more detail and in practical detail and keep under revision exactly the nature and manner in which information must be shared by them and indeed therefore with SPS because SPS are discharging Scottish ministers' duties uh, with regard to much of this bill. So therefore I will be pressing uh, Amendment 31. So while I, I, I am very much aware uh, of what uh, members have said about um, the, the uh, lack of a specification within this. That is deliberate. I think it is important that this legislation is flexible. I think subsection 4 enables that. More broadly, um, while the Minister uh, stated that it, 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 it doesn't take uh, recognition of what is happening and whether or not it is actually necessary, I would argue that the reports made by HMIPS and HMICS spell in very particular detail exactly why this is necessary, because this is a situation that failed. This is a situation that failed with tragic consequences, where information was not shared in a timely or relevant manner, and certainly was not acted on. And so therefore, given those failures, we must put into law to make sure that there is a legal requirement so that information is shared, so it can be acted on. That is why, that is why it is necessary uh, for, for this to be put into law. So because it's not to say that, 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 uh, uh, that what is or is not happening, it is just simply to state that it must happen. I, uh, sorry, was the Cabinet Secretary wanting to come in? So, uh, for me, um, it, was, it was just on that very point, and I did make mention of it in my remarks. Um, again, the good intention behind what Daniel Johnson is trying to do might not actually have the effect he, he's trying to bring forward. Uh, all his amendment. Um, would, 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 would obligate Scottish ministers is to request that information. That doesn't mean that the information would have to wait for that information to come back to make a decision on HTC release. Now, of course, there'd be consequences um, to that, I don't doubt, but the wording in itself is simply about requesting as opposed to having that information come back, digesting it, poring over it, then making an informed decision based on that information. So actually, the practical effect may not fulfil exactly the, what, what, what he articulates. If I may slightly impudently reply, I, I, I'm sorry to hear that the Minister has uh, such a pessimistic view on how other public bodies may respond to ministerial uh, requests. But in all seriousness, I mean, I think that, that the point here is that a, a number of measures and powers, as stated in law, are set out in terms of requests. And, and subsequently, you know, I think if the, the principle is correct, I'd be more than happy to look at amendments to this at stage three to improve uh, how robust uh, that may 
may or may not be. So I will be pressing this amendment because I think it is important. If it does fail, I'll be uh, seeking to, to look at how it could be improved and bring back something at stage three because I do think it is of fundamental importance. The question is that Amendment 31 be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes, we are all agreed. Okay. Uh, amendment is agreed. Call Amendment 131, name of Daniel Johnson, already debated with Amendment 31. Daniel Johnson to move or not move? Not moved. That amendment is not moved. Call Amendment um, in the Amendment number 32 in the name of Daniel Johnson, already um, debated with Amendment 2. Daniel Johnson to move or not move? Moved. The question is that Amendment 32 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? We are not all agreed. Um, there will be a division. Those in favour, please show. And those against? 7-2. Uh, that amendment is agreed. Call Amendment 86 in the name of the Cabinet Secretary, already debated with Amendment 84, Cabinet Secretary, to move formally. Moved. The question is that Amendment 86 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? agreed. We are all agreed. Called Amendment 33 in the name of Daniel Johnson, already debated with Amendment 2, Daniel Johnson to move or moved. not move? Moved. Moved. The question is that Amendment 33 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. We're not all agreed. Um, those in favour, please show. Those against. 7 2 in favour. This uh, Amendment 33 is agreed. Call Amendment 87 in the name of the Cabinet Secretary, already debated with Amendment 84. Cabinet Secretary to move forward. Moved. 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 Yeah. The question is that Amendment 87 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? <laughs> Yes. We are all agreed. Call Amendment 88 in the name of Cabinet Secretary, already debated with Amendment 84. Cabinet Secretary to move formally. I moved. moved. The question is that Amendment 88 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? agreed? We are all agreed. The question is that Section 8 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? agreed. Call Amendment 34 in the name of An Daniel Johnson, already debated with Amendment 2. Jan Daniel Johnson to move or not move? Moved. Moved. The question is that Amendment 34 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? We're not all agreed. There will be a division. Those in favour? Okay. Those against? 7 2, Amendment 34. Is it 84? 34. 34 is agreed. Call Amendment 89 in the name of the Cabinet Secretary, already amend, uh, debated with Amendment 84. Cabinet Secretary to move formally? Moved. The question is that Amendment 89 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? agreed? We are all agreed. Call Amendment 35 in the name of Daniel Johnson, already debated with Amendment 2. Daniel Johnson to move or not move? Uh, moved. The question is that Amendment 35 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. We're not all agreed. Those in favour, please show. Those against? 7-2. Seven, 7-2 two. Seven, two in favour. Amendment 35 is agreed. Call Amendment 36 in the name of Daniel Jens Johnson, already debated with Amendment 2. Daniel Johnson to move or not move? Move. move. The question is Amendment 36 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. We're not all agreed. The question is, Those in favour? Please show. Those against? 7 2. Which means that Amendment 36 is agreed. The question is that Section 9 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? We all agreed. Call Amendment 37, name of Daniel Johnson, already debated with Amendment 2. Daniel Johnson to move or not move? Moved. Moved. The question is that Amendment 37 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Agreed. Uh, those in favour, please show. Those against? 7 in favour, uh, 2 against, Amendment 37 is agreed. Call Amendment 90 in the name of John Finney and a group on its own. John Finney to move and speak to Amendment 90. Uh, thank you very much indeed, Convener. I, I move Amendment 90 in my name. And th th this is fundamentally uh, the position you take in relation to public money, whether you feel that there's a role for the private sector in it. I think in the course of uh, our scrutiny of this legislation, it became very apparent the reliance that there was in the private sector to provide information, both in advance of the, um, the halt that we took um, in scrutiny and, and thereafter. And it's a very pivotal role. So 
Um, I, I don't think there should be a, a, a role for the private sector in such an important area, and, and I'm not alone in that. Indeed, the party of government have a very lengthy list of their, uh, uh, starting in 99 with the, the uh, SNP remains totally opposed to private prisons. 2001, when it passed a motion calling for a halt to the privatisation of prisons. 2003, manifesto says, first we will ensure public services sh should just be that. Public government money intended to provide public services must do that and should not be wasted through inefficiency or taken out of the system to be excessive private profit. We go on to um, the Cabinet Secretary in 2005, when uh, the then Cabinet Secretary for Justice uh, in a BBC documentary in relation to Her Majesty's Prison Kilmarnock said public safety is too important an issue to be at the whim of private profit. Manifesto 2007, we are committed to public loan and run prison service. Um, 2007, blocking the replacement at Bishop Briggs. Um, and so on and so on. Most recently, most recently the previous, one of the Cabinet Secretary's predecessors, um, in a Herald article uh, titled Time to Expose the Lies Behind the Clamour for Private Prisons. So what we have is a situation at the moment where two of our most important public services, the prison service and uh, the, the Scottish Police Service, uh, have this intermediary. I think that that's unhelpful in relation to something as important as community safety. And uh, um, I, I see no reason why the, uh, neither, either of these two jointly or, or individually should be taking charge of this important situation. Now, I know, I know that it's the position of the uh, Scottish Government um, in recent press coverage that this facility is any case available to, to bid for, but that's what's wrong. That's entirely what's wrong, whether we're talking ferries, whether we're talking prisons, whether we're talking the service. This should be based on public service and a service to the public not on who can put together the best um, bid for, a, for a, a franchise or whatever. So um, I hope that the Cabinet Secretary will lend his support uh, to this proposal. I'm entirely in line with his party's uh, long-stated position on it, uh, and I, I look forward to hearing from him on it. Daniel Thank Johnson. You. Thank you, convener. Um, I am far from being reticent about extolling the virtues of the, the private sector. I'm somebody who, prior to coming into Parliament, worked in the private sector for 15 years and ran my own business. But there are limits to the benefits of the private sector, and I would argue that we must uh, be cautious about the role of the, the private sector, and generally in terms of public service provision, but in particular within the criminal justice sphere uh, because of the serious nature with which uh, the crim criminal justice matters uh, are, 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 are to be found. Um, and I think in particular, I think John Finney's amendments, I think, are, are well stated. And I think for two particular reasons. One is practical and one is a point of principle. On the practical matter, there is no doubt that the issues that we have encountered when we're examining the issues around HDC uh, are around the, the, the information sharing and how efficient that has been. And I would argue that any additional uh, in, uh, agencies or organisations involved in that chain of, of information sharing, that sequence of information being passed from uh, one uh, end of that process to the other, is simply going to complicate that. And so I would, argue, I would question whether or not it's actually an advantage or a disadvantage, uh, indeed, for an, an additional and an unnecessary uh, agency or body to be introduced there, regardless of actually whether it's, it's um, uh, uh, public sector or uh, private sector. But in addition to that, I think there is a point of principle here, which is, is it right for private companies to be earning a profit from the incarceration of individuals and the monitoring of them thereafter? And I think that is a question that, that does seem to be. And I think uh, Mr Finney made a, a, a very good case using the, the party of government's own record on this matter. And I think he makes the argument very well. I think the only slight caveat that I would uh, put is that I'm not entirely convinced that actually a third sector organisation or a registered charity necessarily improves matters greatly. I think particularly on the points of practicality, but also indeed in terms of that bidding system. We only have to look south of the... If Mr Finney would like to... Yes. Um, I'm grateful for Mr Johnson taking that intervention. Yes, um, it, it is to give an option. It's not to say I mean, my preference would be public sector. 
But, of course, the motivation of a third sector organisation or a charity isn't the creation of profit. That's a statutory obligation that is placed on the present provider. Profit for the shareholders. Uh, I, I quite agree with that, but there are two other issues that they encounter, and especially if you look at probation services delivered south of the border by third sector organisations, both that point of organisational complexity, but also the bidding process in terms of encouraging a race to the bottom, I think have meant that, that probation services uh, uh, south of the border are widely recognised to, to have degraded. So while I, I, mean, I think I'll be supporting uh, this amendment, um, I, I mainly, merely raise that point as a, as a, as a, as a question mark uh, uh, and, uh, and, and, a, and a point of detail. Uh, but I think this is a well-stated amendment and one that I will be supporting. Rona. Thanks, Convener. Um, yes, I, I mean, I actually ag agree with John Finney's amendment, but just wanted to briefly point out that at the moment, we're still governed by EU law and procurement law, and as such, public and private bodies are entitled to tender. So um, if we were not allowing um, private bodies to tender, we may be in con convention or maybe against that um, law. Just wanted to point that out. John Finney, do you want to respond? I, I would simply say that uh, this is a competent motion or it wouldn't be here. Thank you. And Liam Kerr. Thank you, Convener. My view on this, I'll be voting against it, uh, which I don't think will come as a surprise. Uh, I think the, the amendment starts from a flawed position, that the public sector is automatically better uh, and more efficient than the private sector. I just don't think that stacks up. Uh, Mr Finney says uh, this is about who gives the public service. Well, to an extent, this is about who gives the best service, the best value for money. Uh, and Daniel Johnson goes on to suggest that if something is, is so important, it must be publicly owned. But with respect, that's, that's a facile argument, and it sacrifices the best delivery for dogma. And I was very interested so, to hear him. Uh, can I intervene? Of course you can. My point wasn't that it is better. The point is, is whether or not it is right for a private uh, organisation to make a profit out of delivering a, a, a service such as this. Which suggests that uh, Mr Johnson would sacrifice delivery uh, over principle. Uh, and, and that he puts ideology over the actual delivery of the best service to the public. Um, in summary, I'll be voting against this, but I would be interested when Mr Finney sums up to hear the cost of this proposal, uh, because presumably if we're looking to put it into the Act, that cost will need to be uh, a serious consideration. Where that money is coming from, and also, of course, for his confirmation that he'll support my Amendment 76 that says this must be appropriately resourced before it's passed. Um, Liam MacArthur and Fulton. I, thanks very much. Um, I, I have reservations about the amendment. I think um, picking up the points Daniel Johnson raised about the practicalities and indeed the principle. I mean, I, I, I hear what he's saying, but I can certainly point to examples um, of casework that's passed across my desk in the last 10 years where the communications between entirely public service providers have fallen short of what they ought to be. So I think the, the point he makes about the importance of communication is absolutely right. I think the assumption that um, somehow this is overly complicated and, and falls down where um, you introduce other players that are out with the, 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 the um, the public sector, whether that be in the private sector or indeed the third sector, as, as John Finney has referred to in his, in his amendment, I don't think um, naturally uh, follows. I think in relation to the principle, again, I, I, I hear what he's saying. Um, I think it's why the, the, the contracts and the procurement process have to be um, absolutely tightly defined. But I, I think what we need to uh, ensure is that the delivery against those is, is absolutely right, whether it's the public sector, whether it's the private sector, whether it's the third sector, it's the discussion that myself and, and John Finney have, have um, uh, <coughs> um, had in, in, in perfectly the right spirit in relation to ferry contracts. I, I realise that those are of a, a, a different uh, nature to um, the, the sorts of contracts we're, we're dealing with here, but nevertheless they still provide a lifeline to communities rely on them and, and, and therefore I think the, the principle holds. So I, I think concentrating on what it is that's procured and making sure that is of the highest quality is ultimately um, the, the, the primary concern and therefore with those with those comments, I, I, I think I can confirm that I will not be supporting uh, Mr Finney's amendment. Fulton. Yeah, thanks. Obviously, we're still to hear from the Cabinet Secretary, but at this stage, I'm inclined to reluctantly um, to vote against. And I say reluctantly because I agree with the principle um, of John Finney, who's, who's championed this issue throughout the evidence sessions, and I agree with the principle uh, of it. But I, but I think that, that is what it is. It's a, it's a principled um, amendment, and I'm not actually sure 
that it would uh, achieve the, uh, the goal that, that he desires. Um, and I think, I, I wonder whether it is, it's best placed more in a policy context of the, of the government of the day, um, because John Finney is right to say that it is uh, generally a principle um, of the, the, the SNP, but it's, uh, uh, whether it's in more a policy of the, the government of the day as a, rather than in this bill. Um, so I'll be interested to hear what the Cabinet Secretary says about this point, reluctantly inclined to resist. Uh, I note the ideological um, argument put forward by several members, but for me the absolute crux of um, this um, provision and this measure is that it would preclude potentially the very best people, if that's private sector, um, as opposed to um, public sector, which it may very well be, to effectively and efficiently monitor um, someone to ensure public safety. And for that reason, um, I certainly couldn't um, support it. Cabinet Secretary. Thank you very much. Thank you to John Finney for bringing this uh, amendment uh, forward. I had a shiver up the spine when Lee MacArthur and John Finney started talking about ferries and that debate. I remember it only, only too well. Um, can, can I agree with um, you know, Fulton's uh, remarks about um, you know, understanding the principle and having sympathy with the principle? But I will be uh, urging members to resist uh, Amendment 90 for, for what I think are very good reasons, and I'll, I'll try to articulate them uh, as best I can. Um, I thought the point Rona Mackay made was one that shouldn't be dismissed. Um, and I know John Finney wasn't dismissing it, but it was one that should be given a fair bit of, of weight. We are governed in this area by, by European procurement law. We don't know what is going to happen, of course, in the coming months and, and years ahead. But at the moment, we are uh, governed by European procurement law. We must treat economic operators, uh, and I quote, equally and without discrimination. Uh, any amendment may well be considered outside uh, of competence if it's incompatible with any of the Convention rights or with EU law, uh, and it could potentially be considered ultra vires and open uh, to challenge. Um, moreover, uh, this has rightly been, of course. Surely that only remains the case, providing it's subject to a tendering process at all. Why does the Scottish Government simply not give this duty to either Scottish Prison Service or Police Scotland, and therefore not have it subject to a tendering process, and therefore not subject to those European laws? But I think it would be incredibly difficult to do. I mean, that is currently not the skill set of Scottish Prison Service. That is why we end up uh, putting it out uh, to a tendering uh, process, I think, for, for very good reason and for very good purpose. I'll come to this point in a second when it comes to other public agencies or third sector organisations. I'm not convinced it's also the best use of their time, for example, putting a tag on, on somebody's ankle and, and, and monitoring uh, that. I think there's a role there uh, for potentially the private sector or collaboration of third sector organisations. But I, I don't think it is, well, it's not within the skill set currently of, 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 of SPS. Uh, and well, if I make a little bit more uh, progress, well, okay, on that point, of course. Uh, and and th that is the continuing role for the Scottish Prison Service, because through care and aftercare, and the role that some of these officers play within the community is very positive. There's no threat of them being privatised, is there? Uh, no, no, we're talk not talking about uh, privatisation or, or through care. But again, uh, what we're talking about in terms of electronic monitoring is very different to through care and through care support uh, for a whole variety of reasons. Actually, um, through care, through care, through, yeah, through, care, care, through care. care, for example, can be a, a part, an important element to to, to complement electronic monitoring. Uh, but I'd not say it's uh, it, it's quite uh, the same thing. Um, as a couple of other members have, have already, in fact, John Finney made mention of this himself, that there's nothing that currently precludes uh, public or third sector providers uh, bidding uh, to provide the service. Uh, indeed, the last time we tendered this contract, they did do so. Um, Scottish Government set the standard of service and assessed bidders on a number of criteria, uh, including their organisational values, which allows us to ensure, that in terms of how they operate, uh, any providers' organisational values are well aligned with what, what Scottish Government ministers want to see from the service um, in Scotland. Um, any provider should, I think it's quite important to make this point, any provider that, that wins that contract, uh, that is successful in that tender, um, uh, under that contract from the Scottish Government, uh, we obviously set the technical standards and rules about how data is held and managed. This hopefully provides uh, some reassurance and safeguards that exist around, uh, irrespective of, of, of provider. Also note that this element of the service 
whether it's provided by a private contractor or a public sector, um, was not a substantive part of the stage one evidence. Um, it's important that any um, actions we take in this area are very much led um, by uh, the evidence. Um, it's important to separate out the actual service delivered from how it's sometimes um, reported, especially as the focus on reporting can often be on providers uh, in England and Wales, where the service is vastly different. Um, a recommendation to consider here, consider here was made by, by the Electronic Monitoring Working Group, um, whose work was the genesis for much of this bill. Um, they suggested there could be improved integration of electronic monitoring. The bill has taken steps uh, to uh, address this, with restricted movement requirements being added to community uh, payback orders imposed uh, the first disposal. This means the social work are much more closely uh, involved uh, in, in the conversation. Um, I just wanted to, to, to make that point about joint working. I think it's hugely important. I think if we restrict how we contract um, for a service in this way, not only do we risk not complying with our legal obligations, but I'm not convinced it would work um, or even allow for any joint working arrangements. Uh, I'm not aware of anywhere in the world where this service is delivered without some level of private sector provision. Uh, it's important to be clear Yes. My understanding in most countries, the devices are indeed procured from the private sector, but they are, they are administered by the public sector. We are quite alone or, or relatively unique in terms of actually getting the private sector to do both of those elements. Would the cabinet well, secretary but, uh, acknowledge uh, that point? Well, I, I would look into the detail of that, and, and of course I'll, I'll, I'll reflect on, on what Daniel Johnson says, but you know, he makes the point that there is some private sector involvement. We cannot get away from that fact. It's an important point to make when... John Finney was almost verbatimly quoting SNP manifestos of past um, that we haven't built private prisons because for us there's a point of, of, of principle around that. But we do have to accept that within the justice system, exactly as Daniel Johnson, who will be supporting John Finney's motion, has said, there is some element of private sector um, involvement almost everywhere uh, in, in, in the world. So I'm not uh, of the view, and I've, I've made this point already, but I'll reiterate it, I'm not of the view that it's the best use of, for example, a qualified social worker or through care support worker's time in travelling out and putting a tag uh, on someone's ankle. It's important we bring together the respective strengths of public bodies and third sector operators in supporting the service in Scotland. But I'm not convinced that this is best done by requiring that they take on the responsibility for a monitoring service. Yes, on the through care and the aftercare, which is why we work with those third sector operators. But on the monitoring service, I'm just not um, convinced. Uh, on a more technical drafting point, uh, the amendment prohibits Scottish ministers from contracting with an individual who is not employed in the public sector, but it arguably does not prohibit ministers from contracting with a private sector corporate body and may therefore not uh, achieve the result intended um, by, by Mr Finney. Um, I, I suspect much more in hope uh, than expectation, but I, I would hope that uh, Mr Finney does not press the amendments for the reasons I provided, uh, but if he does, uh, then I would ask him to, to reject uh, the amendment. John Finney, to wind up, press or withdraw? Thank you. I, I will be pressing, uh, convener, and uh, I note that the Cabinet Secretary did say it was a point of principle about prime, private prisons, and, and I'm sure he would accept that uh, party of government isn't exclusive and allowed to have points of principle and one of one of the issues that's that's important here is the, the very point that my colleague Daniel Johnson made that this this becomes an issue because it is tendered because it is put out to tender now the private sector of course has an involvement in almost everything because you know police service don't make their own equipment uh, there's a role it's it's called capitalism it's where we are the reality but What's unescapable um, is that, first and foremost, this is a competent amendment or it wouldn't be here, so I don't think it's helpful to, to, to talk about challenges. Anything's open to challenge if it's... Uh, we have a, a situation where um, there's going to be increased information made available. Um, and we can see that, and uh, people are concerned about the growth of information that's held, and they're particularly concerned if it's held by private bodies. I think that's certainly a fact. Yes, indeed. I really appreciate John Finney giving way for me to, to, to make an intervention. I wonder if there's a specific Scottish example that John Finney can give where private sector involvement has been the problem with this particular service. Well, I would share your view that um, the prison service, private sector involvement is unhelpful. And to advise you, uh, Cabinet Secretary, that you're, the, you're behind the Tory UK government in this because only yesterday they took the contract away from Birmingham prison. We've never built a private prison 
as, 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 as the government, so I don't think I would accept uh, that, that insinuation. Well, that, that was your point of principle, of course, and, and this is a principle it is, whether you see a role. And the, the other thing, so if we're going to accept that the position for any, any limited company, their statutory obligation is to maximise profit. So when Liam Kerr talks about where the money comes from, the money's there already. This is a service that's funded already. It's just about who delivers it. Thank you. Yes. Right. The question is, Amendment 90 be agreed to? Are we all agreed? No. no. We're not all agreed. Those in favour, please show. Those against, please show. Two in favour, seven against. The amendment is not agreed. The question is that section 10 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? agreed. We are all agreed. Call amendments 38 to 45. All in the name of Daniel Johnson, all previously debated. Daniel Johnson to move amendments 38 to 85 on block. Th sorry, 38 to 45 on block. 38 to 45 moved on block. Thank you. Does any member object to a single question being put on amendments 38 to 45? No. The question is that amendments 38 to 45 are agreed. Are we all agreed? No. Um, those in favour, please show. Those against? Seven in favour, two against. Amendments 38 to 45 are agreed. Amendment 46 in the name of... Dan oh, sorry, I've forgotten a section. section. The question is that section 11 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Are all agreed. Good. Call amendment 46 in the name of Daniel Johnson. Already debated with amendment 2. Daniel Johnson to move or not move? Moved. The question is that amendment 46 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? No. We're not agreed. Those in favour, please show. Those against, please show. Seven in favour, two against. Amendment 46 is agreed. Call Amendment 91 in the name of the Cabinet Secretary are already debated with Amendment 84. Cabinet Secretary to move formally. Moved. Question is that Amendment 91 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are all agreed. Call Amendments 47 to 51. All in the name of Daniel Johnson, all previously debated. Daniel Johnson to move Amendments 47 to 51 on block. Moved on block. Thank you. Does any member object to a single question being put to amendments 47 to 51? Uh, no. Um, the question is that amendments 51, uh, sorry, 47 to 51 are agreed to. Are we all agreed? No, we are not agreed. Um, those in favour, please show. And those against, please show. Seven in favour, two against. Amendments 47 to 51 are agreed. And at this point, I'm going to suspend briefly for five minutes for a comfort break.
Amendment 73 in the name of Liam Kerr, grouped with Amendment 74 and 132. Liam Kerr to move Amendment 73 and speak to all amendments in the group. Um, yeah. Uh, so these amendments, which I do move, are, in my view, very simple and very clear. Uh, during the committee stage, and at stage one, we were all concerned that as the bill stands in its initial drafting, offenders can cut off their tag, they can tamper with their tag, and this may not be considered a criminal offence. Amendment 73 seeks to rectify this and make it an offence for an offender to cut off or tamper with their tag, regardless of the form of licence conditions or community order to which the electronic monitoring conditions are attached. Uh, my authority for to bring this forward comes in part from uh, Scottish Women's Aid's evidence uh, to the committee uh, at stage one that uh, a criminal offence for these sorts of breaches is needed uh, because they felt that there needed to be a credible deterrent. Uh, I also seek authority from Victim Support Scotland, Community Justice Scotland and Positive Prisons uh, who talked about a robust response to breaches of monitoring conditions. And it's my view that my Amendment 73 will ensure that. Amendment 74 simply moves from that to ensure that police have powers of arrest where an offender has, for example, cut their tag off. Uh, again, this was in response to evidence from the committee, from the police, that there are grey areas re with regard to their powers to apprehend. My view is this will put it in black and white on the face of the bill to give the police the powers that I think we all heard they needed. So I move both amendments in my name. Okay. Um, amendment 32 is in my name, so I'll speak to it and other amendments in the group, starting with Amendment 132. This covers the situation where there has been a breach of electronic monitoring, monitoring orders. In its Stage 1 report, the committee recommends any breaches have to be swiftly investigated and, found, and when found to be substantive, for example, not due to a technical fault, are responded to quickly and effectively. In particular, the committee noted the powerful evidence here of the Scottish Women's Aid and others who expressed concerns on how breaches will be responded to in real time in cases involving domestic abuse or sexual offences. Given the nature of domestic abuse and sexual offences cases, it is likely that if the offender has breached the electronic uh, monitoring conditions and entered an exclusion zone, there's a very real danger of something adverse happening very quickly. Amendment 102, therefore, 132 therefore seeks to ensure that when there is a suspected brief or breach of um, or of a disposal of conditions that relevant bodies are con uh, contacted by the police specifically cited, um, then, let me say that again, is ensure that when there is a suspected breach of conditions that relevant bodies are con uh, contacted, Police Scotland are specifically cited, but the scope um, is there for Scottish ministers to expand this to any other relevant body they think pertinent. The amendment is drafted in this way as I've been advised by the Bill's team that I'm unable to focus on domestic abuse and sexual offences cases um, specifically in the legislation. And as a, a consequence, I do recognise that the scope of this amendment, if applied to all notification situations, is likely to provide too wide to effectively cover any breach. It's therefore at this stage approving amendment to clarify and allow the Cabinet Secretary to set out how the government envisages that these substantive breaches, not technical breaches, um, relating to de uh, domestic abuse and sexual offence cases can be responded to in real time where someone, for example, does enter um, an exclusion zone. Uh, 
and how we can assure in these circumstances, because it's quite different in nature, I think, from many other offences, that victims are protected from the potential gravity of these breaches. So, where are we now? I move Amendment 132 in my name. Uh, do any other members want to speak? Daniel Johnson. Um, I'd just like to speak briefly uh, in support of both of these amendments, albeit acknowledging the convener uh, is saying that uh, the amendment in her name is, is a probing amendment. Um, in, in part, I think uh, Liam Kerr put it uh, very well that um, there needs to be a, a robust and swift response when, when people breach. And I think the, the, the way that I uh, perceive this is, is as follows, is that, that people released on TAG are there in, in, uh, as a substitute to a prison term. They are out in society on an electronic TAG, and that is a, the, the correct approach. But when they breach those conditions, um, and, it's, and in particular, such a substantial breach as cutting off a, a tag, then that has to be viewed as seriously as someone breaching the conditions of, of prison. It, you know, cutting off a tag needs to be regarded with this, the same level of seriousness as someone uh, going over a prison wall, because that is, in effect, um, the, 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 the comparable situation. I, I, I have had conversations um, about the need to have um, a reasonable element to parts of this. And I think in particular, I do have concerns about uh, all breaches of all conditions, uh, in particular, as the community highlighted, about technical conditions, such as someone arriving 10 minutes late at home, breaching their curfew because the bus was late or there were other. I think that does need to be taken into careful consideration. But I think Liam Kerr is right to, to frame um, uh, the amendment in uh, such stark terms. I think that, that I will listen to what is said about those technical elements. And in terms of the information sharing in Amendment 131, I think this is a, a, an amendment that is well stated and very much in line with some of my other amendments around information sharing. And while the convener may not wish to press it at this time, I would be interested in exploring these issues further. Thank you. John Finney. Thank you, Convener. I think all three of these amendments are interesting and I address what I thought was one of the most interesting bits of information we got in the course of our inquiry, and that was the input from Pete White from Positive Prison, Positive Futures, which has been touched on, and that was that he did say that the counterbalance to this, what might be seen as more liberal, criminal justice regime is that there must be a robust response. So I look forward to hearing what the Cabinet Secretary has to say in this. I'm always a wee bit wary that um, there will be... Uh, occasions where discretion is appropriate in the circumstances of being outlined. But of course, it's important that the person who's <coughs> making these decisions feels empowered to do that. And that's always sometimes a challenge. Thank you. Fulton. Um, I agree with, with, with John Finney's comments here in terms of some of the evidence that we heard through stage one. This was one of the more um, substantial issues um, uh, that, went in, that went into the report. And I, I think uh, Liam Kerr is certainly right to bring it forward. My worry would be that <clears throat> my initial reading of this, and maybe Liam Kerr can address this concern and summing up, uh, but my initial reading of this is at this stage, the, the, the main driver behind Amendment 73 and 74 are of a punitive nature rather than trying to address the concerns uh, that were raised about um, the, um, the cutting off of the electronic tag. So um, I, I'm not inclined to, to support it on that basis just now. Um, but I do think that he was right to certainly bring it along. And I think it's maybe something more for stage three. Liam MacArthur. Thanks very much. Uh, Can we appreciate uh, Amendment 132 is, um, it, it, it is essentially probing and, and uh, that there's perhaps a bit of work to be done to finalise the wording around that. But I, I think, again, it, it illustrates the, the the benefit of bringing forward these amendments at stage two so that can be done ahead of stage three. I think perhaps with 73, 74, there may be um, further revision that, that's uh, necessary, but I'd very much echo uh, John Finney's uh, points about how what we want to see is, is um, a more liberal and progressive regime, but there have to be uh, robust safeguards in there if it's to uh, carry the, the, the confidence of the wider public. So I'll listen with interest to what the Cabinet Secretary has to say. I suspect there probably will be uh, changes still required to, to those amendments but I think it serves a useful purpose in putting down a market at stage two. Yeah, I forgot to just um, say my support for um, this very robust approach, which I think is needed if, if a, a tag is cut off or tampered with. Um, and I look forward to hearing what the Cabinet Secretary has to say. Cabinet Secretary. 
Thank you very much. Uh, Camilla, can I thank uh, both you and, and Liam Kerr for bringing forward uh, these amendments, uh, recognising yours as, as a probing amendment, but I'll do my best to address some of the concerns which you, you, you rightly highlight. And also from th <coughs> Liam Kerr, um, I thought he articulated well the, the, the intention behind uh, his amendments, uh, particularly those well-founded uh, fears that uh, we've heard from survivors of domestic abuse, from victims uh, of, of, of a variety of offences, but recognising conveners as you have done, that particularly with domestic abuse and, and you know, has rightly been in, in, in the spotlight uh, this week, um, the unique nature of that particular uh, offence. So let me try to do my best to address as many <coughs> of those concerns. Um, so I'm conscious of the very um, good intentions, uh, again, behind uh, these amendments. Um, uh, we will not be able to support them uh, because of the concerns that we have in relation to, again, unintended consequences, perhaps, uh, if, if, if nothing else, and I'll speak to them uh, in just a second. It may also be the case that when, at the time of lodging of some of these amendments, uh, members would not have had sight of the government's um, own, own amendments, uh, which creates the new offence of remaining unlawfully at large, and indeed are wider amendments around um, home detention curfew. Um, so you may want to consider these amendments in that context. So Amendment 73, as has been mentioned, would um, make it an offence to contravene the electronic, uh, electronic monitoring requirements set out in Section 12.2 and Section 12.3 of the Bill, um, being the duty to obey instruction of how to use and to wear the tag, and the duty to refrain from tampering with or damaging or destroying uh, the tag. However, this offence would apply to all forms of electronic monitoring, whether imposed by a court uh, alongside a community sentence <coughs> or indeed imposed by the Scottish Ministers on early release from prison. The amendment does not provide for any form of defence for an individual who contravenes the electronic monitoring requirement. Uh, an individual who has a reasonable excuse for cutting off a tag would still be committing an offence. There's a point that's been raised by a number of members, Daniel Johnson asking about what would happen if the bus turned up 10 minutes late. Well, this amendment, as it's drafted, does not, um, <coughs> does not uh, provide for any form of, of, of reasonable excuse for cutting off a tag. The, the, please. Just on that point, if I may, Cabinet Secretary, what, what does the Cabinet Secretary see as a reasonable excuse for cutting off or tampering with a tag? Oh, I, I'll come to that in a second, but there may be, for example, a medical reason why somebody had to cut off a tag. Let's say, for example, they injured their leg, it was ble bleeding, the wound was exactly where the tag was. If medical treatment had to, to take place and they had to cut off the tag, that would be, we would agree, I think, a reasonable excuse. But that is not permitted. Now, I accept that that is an exceptional case that might happen. But, you know, the law must be able to, to, to allow for those flexibilities uh, and those reasonable excuses. Please. And I think this is an important detail. Um, but would he acknowledge that I think there is, I think, an argument to be made that where someone deliberately removes a tag with the intent of evading the conditions of that HC, that that should be an explicit uh, 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 offence. And would he consider examining uh, a form of words uh, to, to make that a specific offence going forward, albeit with the conditions that where someone may have a reasonable uh, belief that they will come to harm because they're, they're, they're tagged, that that may be a kind of an, an excuse? So if, if you'll give me time to, to pro progress my argument slightly, I was just touching upon the reasonable excuse point, but if it allows me to, to, to develop my, my, my argument slightly, um, I, I'm not convinced that just that element should be an offence, and I'll come to why, because I think there's issues around creating hierarchies, I think there's unintended consequences, and I think the approach we're taking as a government around unlawful at large is the best approach to try to allay some of those fears uh, that, that, that exist. Um, another issue with the way the amendment is drafted is the proposed offence would only be tri uh, tri uh, tri triable uh, in summary proceedings uh, with a maximum sentence of 12 months um, imprisonment or a fine at level five on the standard scale, uh, or indeed both, um, with the forthcoming raising of the presumption against short, against short sentences to 12 months, there would be presumption, therefore, against imprisonment for this new offence, if, of course, the presumption passes. Um, the individual uh, may therefore be likely to receive a fine. Um, the new offence doesn't clarify what should happen uh, if an individual cuts off their tag and receives a fine for breaching the underlying community sentence. So an individual who cuts off their tag and therefore breaches their community sentence could, in the case of uh, an RLO or a CPO, be fined by the court 
and the underlying order can continue in force. A further fine could then be imposed for the new offence created in Amendment 73, therefore, therefore enabling two separate financial punishments to be imposed on the individual for the same course of conduct. Um, part of the rationale also for not making cutting off a tag uh, or a general breach of licence condition a further offence is that there are already sanctions for those who cut off an electronic tag or otherwise breach the conditions of a licence or community sentence. An individual who breaches their licence conditions can be recalled to prison to serve the requisite part of their sentence. A short-term prisoner on HDC would require to return to prison until their automatic release or indeed at the halfway stage. A long-term prisoner on HDC or parole would likely see their parole withdrawn and would only be re-released once the parole board considers it appropriate. If an individual serving a community sentence cuts off an electronic tag or otherwise breaches the conditions of a licence, they can currently be returned to court find and the terms of the underlying community sentence can also be varied in response. <clears throat> Alternatively, the court could revoke the community sentence and sentence the individual afresh, which can involve imposing a sentence of imprisonment. The bill provides an electronic monitoring requirement, which can be imposed in community sentences and, and licence conditions. The electronic monitoring requirement is that the individual must wear an electronic tag and refrain from damage, damaging or tampering the tag. The bill currently provides that a breach of the electronic monitoring requirement constitutes a breach of the underlying court order or the underlying licence conditions. This enables the breach provisions discussed above for early release and community sentences to be triggered where an individual cuts off um, an electronic tag. The bill expressly provides that if a breach of an underlying community sentence constitutes an offence, that offence will not be committed by breaching the EM requirement. Um, in addition, we've brought forward a stage two amendment to make it an offence to remain unlawfully at large. In that respect, we agree with Liam Kerr that an additional punishment is required beyond the return of the individual to prison and the impact on their future release. The new unlawfully at large offence provides this additional punishment. The unlawfully at large offence also fulfils the October 2018 HMICS recommendation without further offences being required. An individual on licence who cuts off their tag will be recalled to prison, and if they fail to return timiously, they will be committing an unlawfully at large offence. An individual serving a community sentence who cuts off their tag can be fined or imprisoned under existing legislation. So we propose to resist this amendment uh, for those following reasons. Uh, the existing breach procedures for parole, HDC, temporary release already enable the immediate recall of the individual uh, to prison. The existing breach procedures applicable to community sentences already enable the court to punish an individual who cuts off their tag. The new offence of cutting off a tag was set alongside existing punitive measures available to the court in relation to community sentences, which could result in the individual being fined uh, twice over. The creation of an unlawful at large offence reduces the need for the offence of cutting off a tag in the context of those released um, from prison uh, on licence. Um, the unlawfully at large, and this is a really important point, would uh, apply to all breaches of licence conditions, include, including cutting off a tag where the individual is recalled and doesn't uh, comply timiously. The unlawfully at large offence would, by definition, exclude community sentences and their side, thereby sidestep the need for a similar measure in relation to those uh, orders. And again, a crucial point, if the offence was to be restricted to just cutting off or damaging the tag, we could be elevating that electronic monitoring licence condition above all other conditions, even if those other conditions were potentially more important to protecting the public. Uh, for example, if an individual staying in their house and cutting off the tag, they would be committing an offence, but an individual breaching a condition not to go near a school and they breach that condition, well, they might not be committing an offence. But it's for, yes. For on that point. I, I, I accept to some degree what he's saying, but, but the point is here, we are dealing with electronic mo monitoring and it's the tag that makes those conditions possible. So if you cut off the tag, you're cutting off the very thing that makes those conditions, albeit the, the, the point, but you're making the means of those, uh, those conditions and monitoring those conditions uh, uh, impossible in the moment you cut it off, and therefore it, it is of a more fundamental order for that precise reason. Well, I, I, would, I would take some exception to, to that with the example that I gave, that uh, actually, uh, you know, somebody could keep the tag on, be told that licence condition was not to go near a school for very good reasons, breach that, and that might not be an offence, whereas cutting off the tag, sitting in their home, 
would not be. Now, we can argue uh, about whether that's um, uh, more or, uh, sorry, worse of, of, of an offence or, or, or not, or a breach of the condition or, or, or not. My point is that I don't disagree with the general intent behind what Liam Kerr is trying to do. What I'd suggest is actually making unlawfully at large would cover all of those potential breaches, including cutting off a tag at an offence. And that is, that, is what, that is why it is a better approach, rather than elevating one breach uh, or one particular breach of a licence, albeit a very important one and, and a very serious one um, in, in, in relation to, to others. Uh, I'm going to move on to uh, Amendment 74. It provides power of arrest where a constable suspects an individual has committed an offence, um, created in Amendment 73. Amendment 74 does not specify whether this arrest can be effected with or without a warrant. Uh, this amendment is unnecessary, regardless of whether or not um, the Amendment 73 offence remains in the Bill. Section 1, uh, 1 of the Criminal Justice Scotland Act 2016 empowers a constable to arrest an individual without warrant where the constable has reasonable grounds for suspecting that the individual has committed or is committing an offence. We would therefore propose to resist Amendment 74 on the grounds that it is duplicating existing legislation, thereby creating confusion as to which provision applies in any given case. Yep. Uh, I'm grateful for taking intervention. We do recognise that that's not what we heard from Police Scotland. They said they didn't have a power of arrest. Well, we'll try to give uh, clarification to that with uh, the, the amendment we will bring forward in relation to, to, to unlawfully uh, at large. Um, but, uh, you know, I'm very clear with the powers that currently exist uh, and we've checked and, and double-checked this in relation to Section 1.1 of the Criminal Justice Scotland Act. Uh, 2016, but that's not to take away from the recommendations made by uh, HMICS uh, in the report, and therefore hopefully our uh, amendment bringing forward and lawfully at large um, and, and, and the further amendments will give clarity to the powers uh, of, of arrest that are available or not. Secretary, just to, uh, if I might pick up on that point, uh, because I share John Finney's concern. Uh, we heard very clearly in committee from uh, officers that if they were to find somebody of an evening who, who they clearly felt was unlawfully at large, they did not have the power to arrest them. Uh, I'm paraphrasing very much, I appreciate, but that was certainly the evidence that I heard, and I believe the committee heard, uh, that they did not have that power. The Cabinet Secretary seems to be suggesting that that's a misunderstanding on the part of the police. Uh, is that correct? No, uh, no, I'm not suggesting that in, in, in the slightest. I mean, there's a difference between um, the powers of arrest when there's a suspected breach and when there's a breach that's being confirmed. I think that's a really important point uh, to make. I suppose the second point um, that I'd like to make is where the police need that clarification. We're happy to provide that clarification in relation to amendments that we'll bring forward. Uh, I'm not convinced that your amendment tied to Amendment 73 uh, is the right way uh, to do that. Um, but I'm happy to give uh, those reassurances where we can with any amendments um, that we bring forward. Because uh, if an individual breaches a, a community sentence, the court has a power to issue a warrant for their arrest. If an individual breaches a licence conditions, they can obviously be recalled to prison, and upon recall, they're deemed to be unlawfully at large. An individual who's unlawfully at large can be arrested without a warrant, uh, and a constable can obtain a warrant to enter and search premises to arrest an individual who's unlawfully at large. This latter power is being clarified in the bill. There are existing powers for a constable to arrest an individual who cuts off their electronic tag, which makes, I think, Amendment 74 unnecessary. Amendment 74 does not refer to the offence created uh, in Amendment 73. Accordingly, these amendments are not codependent, so the rejection of one, I suppose, is not a necessity of the rejection of the other. That being said, we would, um, we would uh, recommend rejection of both for, for the reasons uh, I've, outlined, I've outlined. In terms of Amendment um, 132, uh, I appreciate him probing, but I think um, important nonetheless, points made by the convener. Um, it would uh, place an obligation on the designated person to report every suspected breach on the community sentence or licence condition to the police, whether or not the designated person considers that uh, breach should be addressed by the police uh, or not. So an individual who's five minutes late for the HDC curfew would require to be reported to the police, even though the police would not act on that information uh, unless an individual has been recalled. Uh, similarly, an individual who's five minutes late for uh, a restriction of liberty order curfew would require to be reported to police, even though they would have no interest in that case unless the court uh, issues a warrant for the arrest uh, for, for, for the individual. 
Um, all, all of that being said, um, the point that the points that the convener raises around the importance of this issue in relation to the particular offence of domestic abuse um, is an important one. Um, issues of support and compliance. Um, with electronic monitoring were developed with partners as part of the EM Users Requirement Working Group to give the convener some reassurances on that. Victim Support Scotland, a part of that group. Scottish Women's Aid, a part of that group. Turning Point, Positive Prisons, Positive Futures uh, are also uh, members uh, of that group um, as well. Um, I should say that the, the, the drafting of this amendment also means that the section applies um, where the individual is suspected of having breached uh, a Section 3 disposal or Section 7 licence conditions. There is no reference to an electronic monitoring requirement here, so the section arguably could capture any breach of a disposal uh, or licence listing in Section 3 Dervention. or 7. Yes. Uh -huh. Yeah, I understand this is a flawed amendment. That's why it's a probing amendment. The substantial reason for um, raising it is to address domestic abuse and sexual offences, whereby the nature of it, if a tag is tampered with, if they enter an, ex an exclusion zone, then the likelihood is, more than I think with any other offence, that there is one purpose in mind, the victim in mind, and for an adverse consequence to, um, to occur. So my question to you is, how do we address that in this legislation? Yeah, I, I suspect that some of this will come down to the guidance that we end up uh, producing for um, electronic monitoring, but it goes back to that EM users requirement working group that we have. The reason why we have Scottish Women's Aid in particular on that group is to try to see how we can address some of those uh, concerns. I think the unlawfully at large offence that I bring forward will help to give some element of comfort uh, in that, um, but uh, certainly uh, upon um, drafting updated guidance, it will be submitted to uh, Social Work Scotland's Justice Standing Committee uh, when the review is complete and shared with local authorities thereafter. But that working group that I've spoken about, I think, will help us to... to we'll, we'll, we'll make sure that we give secretary. assurances. There's a very real, if I understand the direction you're going in, that we pass it and then we'll look at the, um, the guidance later and hope, and just hope, that we get it right I don't think that's good enough for victims of domestic abuse. I don't think it's good enough for the victims of sexual offence when we know that in real time this legislation could be putting them in danger. So I ask you, how can we address this in this bill and is this something that we can look at again at stage three on the face of the bill? And it may be that perhaps um, these are offences that are not appropriate for... Oh this legislation? Yes, I mean, I always work with, with members in advance of, of, of various stages to, to try to give as much reassurance as I possibly can. I, I'm not convinced, I have to say, that um, having uh, assurances on the face of the bill is the appropriate place uh, for it. I may be proven wrong in that, and, and we can have a, 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 I'm open to persuasion uh, in that in advance of stage three. Uh, we'll have a conversation with the likes of Scottish Women's Aid and, 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 and others to try to determine because if they have... If, if you let me just finish yeah, the point, and of course I'll, I'll ask you to come back in. Um, uh, what, what I would suggest is uh, we have given reassurances in relation to the unlawfully at large uh, offence. Um, we have the EM users requirement working groups, so when we do choose to adopt new technologies, be it GPS or others in relation to electronic monitoring, then that group uh, will be one that will be consulted and that we will consult with. But of course, uh, I'm open to, to working in advance of stage three to see if we can give some further reassurances to you or to other, any other members. I suppose the proposal was that domestic abuse and sexual offences were looked at a category where there would automatically be a swift response by the nature of the offence, by the police to investigate, to attend and to establish if there was a potential danger. Yeah, again, I'm happy to, to, to look at that and have that conversation. I mean, in some cases, again, breaches will be a matter for the courts and not a matter for the police. There will be some, uh, and that is the nature of the law, that some of these, uh, depending on, on, on the type of uh, licence that you're on. But, um, you know, you make a point in particular offences, um, then, then, of course, I'll be, I'll be open minded to look at it. Give me Cabinet Secretary, but can I intervene here? If we didn't pass this legislation, these people would be behind bars and there would be, at that stage, 
no threat to the people that I'm talking about. It's the fact we are passing this legislation now that has potentially put them in danger, and that's what I'm asking you to look at. Stage yeah, three. I will happily look at that with you and stage three. Okay. In advance of stage three. Thank you. Liam Kerr to wind up. Um, press or withdraw. Thank you, convener, and thank you to all the members and cabinet secretary for the uh, very interesting contributions and debate. Uh, just to address some of the points, uh, Fulton McGregor was concerned that the main driver behind 73 and 74 uh, was about uh, punitive, uh, or th these were punitive amendments rather than to address concerns. And I would say, just to reassure him, that that is not correct. They, these are directly to address the evidence from the committee, uh, the uh, certain tragic events that have happened uh, and certainly in this regard I associate myself very much with some of the comments of uh, Daniel Johnson who talked uh, about how seriously we view or should view uh, the cutting off the tampering of a tag and uh, particularly in his comments of this this is as serious as, as going over the, the prison wall of course. I appreciate the intervention. I appreciate it might be an oversight. I don't think anybody eh, is disputing that the cutting off the tag is a, is a very serious action. And I think we all generally agreed the, the, the principle of your amendment. But if the, if the main driver wasn't a punitive one, eh, rather than to, to address a concern, why is there nothing in the amendment about individual circumstances, like the Cabinet Secretary pointed out, around health concerns? Uh, well, it is a very serious action, and that's precisely why I address uh, brought up Scottish Women's Aid, uh, talking about it needs to be there needs to be a credible deterrent, uh, and uh, positive prisons have been mentioned several times, uh, quite rightly, uh, talking about how we need a robust response. But uh, again, uh, uh, to answer your question directly, I thought um, uh, John Finney and Liam MacArthur. Uh, made some important points in that regard. There will be occasions where uh, we need discretion, but what we need, above all, is a safe regime. Uh, I do understand the ethos behind what's, what this bill is about, uh, but we do need that counterbalance. We do need that robustness. Uh, in which regard, I turn to uh, the Cabinet Secretary's comments. I, I, I don't accept that this is too punitive. Uh, but I think we had a, a very interesting discussion uh, about the government's amendment, and perhaps we'll look uh, in more detail at that later. Uh, that is something that I think I can support in the alternative, but I don't want to, because I want this to go through. Um, the reason being, I think, Cabinet Secretary, that the unlawfully at large amendment uh, will only apply to home detention curfew. Uh, and that, of course, is just one of, I think, ten disposal types listed in this bill. Uh, my concern on that is that we may be seen to not have learned the lessons of the Craig McClelland, McClelland uh, murder that Daniel Johnson brought up earlier. Um, we have to learn the lessons from that case to ensure there's zero tolerance across the board. Uh, and so I think in terms of the unlawfully at large, my concern is that the, the principle, I see what the Cabinet Secretary is trying to do, but I think the amendment proposed, and we'll no doubt debate this later, but I think it's insufficiently powerful. Um, my understanding of the Cabinet Secretary's offence is that uh, it will be committed when the offender doesn't immediately return to custody once the licence is revoked. And my view is that that's just not powerful enough. Cabinet Secretary, you want to... I thank Liam McCare for giving me just, just a point of clarification. Uh, unlawful at large doesn't apply just to HCC, it applies to parole and also temporary release um, as well. But, but just on the point that I made about, you know, unlawful at large will look at any breach of a licence condition and therefore somebody potentially being recalled. Why does he think that it's a lesser offence for an individual to breach a condition of going near a primary school vis a vis when they shouldn't be? vis-a-vis -vis cutting off a tag, sending it home. Why is he creating that hierarchy um, when actually our unlawfully at large offence doesn't create that hierarchy and punishes rightly um, anybody who, who uh, goes unlawfully at large? Uh, I'm grateful to the Cabinet Secretary. I don't actually accept that it is creating a hierarchy. I think Daniel Johnson, uh, in his intervention, uh, actually dealt with that point pretty well. Uh, i just refer back to that. Uh, I will come back to, to that point just in, in two seconds, if I may. Just on the Amendment 74, um, so this is the uh, point about the o officer 
the constable being able to arrest the offender. Um, my view is that that power is needed. Uh, I think the unlawfully at large offence risks putting delay into the system. Uh, it risks going back and forth before the offender is actually brought back. And as we saw again in the Craig McClellan case, I think any delay, any inability to, uh, to, to, to bring people straight back can lead to tragic, irreversible consequences. And I don't think that we should risk this. I think we need a robust power that 73 and 74 give. Uh, and just in summing up, without these amendments, I can't see that there is any guarantee that an offence is committed for cutting off a tag. That is the power that this amendment uh, will give. And so, in summary, my view would be that I would encourage members to uh, vote for my amendments today, 73 and 74, accepting what the Cabinet Secretary has said, and I hear the concerns, but what I would encourage committee members to do is vote for these amendments and allow the Cabinet Secretary to bring forward subsequent amendments uh, in terms of defences at stage three uh, once we have the power in place. Thank you. Okay. Um, I take it you are pressing. I am pressing. pressing. The question is, Amendment 73 be agreed to? Are we all agreed? Yes. No. We are not all agreed. Those in favour, please show. Those against, please show. Three in favour, six against. Uh, amendment 73 is not agreed. Call Amendment 74 in the name of Liam Kerr. Already debated with Amendment 73. Liam Kerr to move or not move? Moved. Move. The question is, Amendment 74 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? No. Yes. We are not all agreed. Those in favour, please show. Those against? Are there any abstentions? So four, four, and an abstention. What's the um, status quo? Uh, I use my casting vote to, it's 4-4, four, four, and I use my casting vote in favour of this amendment. So this amendment, 74, is agreed. Call amendment 92 in the name of the Cabinet Secretary, already debated with amendment 84, Cabinet Secretary, to move formally. Moved. The question is that Amendment 92 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are all agreed. The question is that Section 12 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are all agreed. Call Amendment 52 in the name of Daniel Johnson, already debated with Amendment 2. Daniel Johnson to move or not move? That moved. Move. The question is that Amendment 52 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. No. no. We're not all agreed. These, uh, those in favour, please show. Those against? Seven, Seven in favour, two against. Amendment 52 is agreed. Co me. Yes? Forgive me. Uh, on a point of order or some such, okay. uh, I am going to oppose every single time that Daniel Johnson brings this uh, amendment forward, and there are mm -hmm. significant numbers. Uh, I wonder if there's some process by which... Uh, well, we if it know. helps, on this particular occasion, we're only going to go to Amendment 53, and given the time restraints and the fact that we've got other items in the agenda, and to assure that each of these amendments have the fullest debating time and consideration, then I will be stopping after 53, so perhaps that solves your dilemma. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> OK. <laughs> Call Amendment 53 in the name of Daniel Johnson, already debated with Amendment 2. Daniel Johnson, to move or not move? Moved. The question is, Amendment 53 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? No. Yes. no. We're not agreed. Those in favour, please show. <laughs> Those against, please show. Seven in favour, two against. Amendment 53 um, is agreed and we'll stop consideration of amendments at stage two at this point. And it only remains for me to thank the Cabinet Secretary for attending. Right. Oh, do you think? I'll spend for a minute to allow the Cabinet Secretary and these officials to leave.
Agenda item two is consideration of a negative instrument, an act of sedarent, um, rules of the court of session, sheriff appeal court rules, an ordinary cause rules, amendment, taxation of judicial expenses, 2019 SSI, 2019 oblique 74. The Delegated Powers and Law Reform Committee has considered and reported on this instrument and had no comments on it. I refer members to paper one, which is noted by the clerk. Do members have any comments on the instrument? If uh, there is no comments, therefore, uh, is the committee agreed that it does not wish to make any recommendations in relation to this instrument? Agreed. Um, before we move to um, into private session, could I have agreement to take item four um, in private? It's our work programme. And uh, in fact, yes, it is. Okay. That being the case, that concludes the public part of today's meeting. Our next meeting will be Tuesday, 23rd of April, where we will continue our consideration of the management of Offender Scotland Bill at stage two. And it only remains for me to wish everyone a very happy Easter. We now move into private session.